Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Complete Sports Media's podcast. I'm your host, Darren Campbell. And tonight, we got a special podcast for you. Super excited. We're going to do a preview of the Major League Baseball season. It is kicking off tomorrow. No games today. Spring training, Cactus League, and Grapefruit League is behind us. World Baseball Classic is in the rearview mirror, but here we go. We're, we got baseball to break down, talk about, watch. I'm going to be couch surfing for about 12 hours tomorrow, watching ball. I uh, can't wait. Uh, I'm super excited. This is going to be an unprecedented season. Something we will talk about until we're 80, 90 years old, I'm sure, about this season, because it will be unprecedented. Something, lots of changes, tons of changes to the game. Uh, to break it down with us, we've got two very special guests uh, starting off. We've got Dale Corey, longtime friend, friend of the show, a uh, very big baseball guy, been a massive New York Mets fan his entire life, and uh, this will be fun. I can't believe uh, we're being able to do this. Uh, Dale, thanks so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here, and I'm thinking I'm a Mets fan from the middle of Saskatchewan. I don't think there are too many of us around like that, so. but I'm <laughs> looking forward to the talk. Good, good. Awesome. And... Uh, on the bottom there, you see him, Barry Grant Jr. joining us from New York City, uh, also a diehard Mets fan. Uh, Barry runs the Grid Network as well as the All Even Podcast. Uh, I never miss an episode of the podcast. You should not as well. Uh, we, you get to laugh. You get to hear some amazing perspectives on sports and uh, just get entertained every week. Uh, thanks so much also for joining us, Barry. Appreciate it a lot. My pleasure, man. It's always it's always fun when you uh, have me on your show, Darren. So I'm looking forward to it, man. Yeah, me too. This is going to be great. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, 12 hours of ball tomorrow. Uh, it kicks off. I've got a clock, actually, to my <laughs> left here. Uh, the first pitch is 16 hours, 20 minutes, and 15 seconds away. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait. <laughs> it I can't is wait, man. counting down. Uh, the first games are the <laughs> New York Yankees. Uh, they will, uh, they, they will, they'll be in there. The Mets, these guys, uh, team kicks off at, uh, 1 PM Pacific, 4 PM, uh, Eastern time. So, um, yeah, we're going to break down those games and I talk about a ton of things. Uh, the thing I love about baseball so much is just all the nostalgia you get, you get to see the diamond as soon as you enter the field, as soon as you enter the stadium, you see the diamond. You hear the crack of the bat. You hear the pitches. You hear people yelling, beer, hot dogs, peanuts. Uh, you get to just get in this atmosphere. It's, it's an amazing sport. It is the most viewed live sport in North America. Uh, millions and millions and millions of people enter the ballpark every year and uh, get to catch games. Uh, I just love it. Always have one of my favorite sports and just such a – such a great sport to cover, follow. Uh, I know you guys, as a, as you've said to me before, uh, you've been ball fans your entire life. It, it's just such a such a special sport. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, man. Get yeah. yeah, Dale. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, uh, yeah, you know what? It's just it's it's so exciting, and and I mean for everybody and and baseball fans everywhere. For us in Canada, it kind of signals spring in some ways. So right. we kind of make that transition as well. Although uh, living in the Okanagan and, and Darren in the Lower Mainland, we don't have the cold temperatures that other places get. But uh, yeah. but it signals spring and and it signals something new for us to get into. And especially uh, when you're diehard baseball fans as we are, you get that much more excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, it's it's still for me the national pastime. Uh, you know, obviously the NFL football has taken over in regards to being the most popular, but baseball just still has this traditional feel to it. Like there's nothing like opening day. There's nothing like opening day. There's, you know, just like you said, Darren, the crack of the bat, you know, just the walk to the ballpark, the, the excitement that people have every, every organization, every team believes that they have a chance to win the world series that year. You know, it's just, there's just all this hope and all this enthusiasm and, you know, it's just great, man. It's just great to see um, the turnouts every year. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm just really, really excited. Really, really yeah. excited. Yeah. Me as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
I just, as I said, I love to crack the bat. I love uh, the hundred mile an hour pitches. You hear it hitting the catcher's mitt. Uh, it's just such a feeling. Uh, it's become pretty uh, exciting too when uh, home runs happen. Uh, the bat flips, the uh, trotter on the bases. Uh, you get this home run jacket now, home run gold chain. They ride them in the laundry cart up and down the dugout. Uh, sunflower seeds are thrown on them. There's been a lot more celebration than uh, previous years. Uh, we've started to see a lot more fun put into the game. Are you enjoying that aspect of it? You, uh, you, you go, Barry. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that, you know, I spoke about the tradition of it, right? But there's a lot of times where that tradition can be a double-edged sword. Sometimes you want to stick to your laurels too much and not make people, you know, express themselves. There's a lot of characters in the game. This game is young, uh, run by young, talented guys. So you have to allow them to express themselves. You know, you, you go back into the 80s and see all the enthusiasm and all the expression that was in Major League Baseball, even going into the 90s. Like, you saw that, and then for some reason, it just kind of went away. And, you know, the 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 heart of baseball really went away with it. You know what I mean? And I think slowly but surely, you're starting to see the uptick in regards to interest. Um, they still have a long ways to go. Uh, but they're they're at least trying to make strides to make the game appealing and exciting, you know, not only for the fans, but for the players as well. You know, yeah. they, they, they you have to love the game, but you also should be allowed to express yourself in a way that really makes you enthusiastic about playing the game. So, yeah, you know, I, I love that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think it's so much better. I think the fans appreciate it. There was such a dark period there where. You celebrated you next time you're up to bat, you got a ball yeah. towards your head. That's uh, right. that wasn't yeah. a good part of baseball. And I'm glad that it's moving towards uh, being able to express yourself. Well, you, do you agree, Del? Yeah. Oh, very much so. And, and I think there can be a difference. And we all see guys at times in all sports where, where they kind of um, kind of throw back in the face of the opposition, whether it's, you know, a, a, uh, a pitcher after hitting a home run or something like that or whatever the case may be and I've never been a big fan of that the sports that I've played I'm like just play your thing do right. your thing you don't have to throw back in somebody's face but yeah. I think the, the celebration is is honest at this point I think when those guys celebrate from hitting a home run hey how, how do you not get excited about that right. as a fan as well how does he not as a player and he wants to celebrate celebrating with your teammates I think is cool I think you know Sometimes it, it can go overboard a little bit, but hey, these guys are playing a professional game. They're in a, in a stadium with 50,000 people around them. How do you not get excited about all of that? Absolutely. 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 Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, okay, we're going to break down a ton of things. We're going to get into it, but I have three rules that I want to implement right away <laughs> to make sure that we uh, have a good podcast. We'll all be happy at the end of it. Uh, first rule is no open-ended bets. I don't want any open-ended <laughs> bets. Okay. Uh, Barry, why don't you tell um, the reason why I'm implementing that clause and that rule? Well, well, on my show, Dale, I, we had a uh, we had a resident Eagles fan. He's a big time Philadelphia Eagles fan, and we had made a bet before the Super Bowl that if he if the Eagles were to win. He can come on my show and host my show. He can be able to do whatever he wanted. I could just, I would just have to sit there. He would have to create the topics and do whatever he wanted. And he was like, oh, I'm going to bring Philly cheesesteaks and I'm just going to, I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm going to kick my feet up on your desk and it's going to be a wonderful show. So I said, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. But what happens if you lose? So he said that uh, it doesn't matter. You can bet whatever we, we can, we can bet whatever it is. Doesn't matter. So Obviously, we know what happened. The Eagles lost. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I had a surprise for him the following week on the show. I said that I have your surprise. And it was him getting a tattoo appointment to get my face on his leg. So, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I will give you the link of that show so you can actually see it. And he has the tattoo. <laughs> Of my face <laughs> on his leg, and it, it was it was great fun though, man. You know, it was a lot of fun. You know, we got a lot of people involved in it. Tattoo shop was really really good. It, it was just a great yeah. time, great excitement. You know, just just a great great atmosphere. So you know, we 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 got a kick out of it. Yeah. 
I don't like your style, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been it might have been fun and cool, but I I don't want your uh, face anywhere on my body. Uh, I I've reached this many years without any tattoos. The first it's one tough. I'm getting isn't going to be your, your face, it's, especially away my, from my exactly, no especially bats. my ugly mug. You don't want it on you. You don't want it on you. <laughs> uh, okay, rule number two: uh, we've got to keep the. Uh, the name Steve Steve Cohen down to a very minimum. I don't want Gonna to try. hear him, <laughs> hear his voice. I've been hearing about him so much in this offseason. Uh, I need it to be minimal, maybe four or five references to Steve Cohen, and then that's it, okay? We're going to try, okay? There's, there's a lot and of definitely nothing about, Right. And definitely nothing about the Will Ponds. No, 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 there whatsoever. no, no, no. Okay. no. Those, and, those, uh, those guys are because, I'm a Yank, because I'm a Yankees <laughs> fan, I'm usually uh, very hated on by Mets fans. And there's a lot of trash talking back and forth. And uh, I need the trash talk to be kind of minimal so we can get to everything. <laughs> uh, we're both yeah, we're both yeah, New York fans. Uh, I'm on one side, you're on the other. Uh, I, you know, you got to like that. I respect you, you guys. Go. You got to respect me. You, you know, you know what's funny about that, Darren, is that you're trying to be very very diplomatic about it we get it we're, we're, we're yeah. gonna give you we're gonna give you some grace but just understand yeah. that there's a lot of tribalism when it comes to our baseball in new york okay <laughs> <laughs> i get it i get it i understand okay cool well we got the rules out of the way uh speaking of rules uh, major changes to major league baseball um the only sport that i watched without a clock uh, for my entire life, and suddenly they said, "Uh oh, no, we need a clock now. We got to speed this up for TV for the ADD generation. We got to make sure it's minimalized. Uh, we got to change the way that they for stealing. We got to do rule changes so they can't have shifts. Lots of very major changes to the game. Uh, are you a fan of one, some, all?" Uh, you start, Dale, and tell me uh, what you're thinking of the massive changes to the game. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I have MLB.com. I pretty much come home. Games at 4.30 here when the Mets are on the East Coast, which is most of the time. Um, so I'm plunked in front of my computer, usually sitting on my deck in the sunshine watching a game. Uh, would I like to see it go a little quicker? Yeah, I think. I think the the nice thing about going to a hockey game or a basketball game pretty much in two hours and 15 minutes or two and a half hours, you're done. Uh, but that said, we're all hardcore baseball fans. We love the game. We love everything about it. And the fact that it's got centuries behind it and, and things have pretty much remained the same, little tweaks here and there. Um, I guess it's, I'm going to say it's, it's going to be up to the players to see how they work with all this. If they... All right you know, somewhat rebel against it. If, if there's pushback from the fans, the hardcore fans that they don't like it. The, and I'm, I guess I'm talking about the speed of the game and the pitch count at this point, the bases, I don't know. I was looking at some of the dimensions here. It's, it's getting you three inches closer to home plate running to first or coming from third, six inches on the other bases. I don't know how much that's going to make a difference. If you're still in a base, you got a little bit more to grab on the base. I guess it can make a bit of a difference there. The shift. I, I, Maybe was never a fan of it, but it was the same for everybody. So if you wanted to put all all eight guys on the right hand side of the field and you're going to gamble, he doesn't hit it to the left side. Uh, I guess that's up to you. You can you can kind of do that on your own. So uh, the shift I'm I'm maybe a little softer on because I think you know teams can maybe still get around that to some degree. But the the speeding of the game, I don't mind that, but I think it's got to be done the right way. Uh, you know, when you get games that are three hours and 40 minutes, it's a long time. It's tough to keep the fans excited about the game. And you want to try to grow it to a mass audience as much as possible, I think. So that's yeah. kind of an overview of a little bit of everything there. Yeah, great. Yeah, Barry, what, do, what about your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think I'm going to agree with Dale in regards to the the the, uh, the pitch clock in regards to the game, speeding up the game. You know, I'm I'm a traditionalist. You know, the game, the 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 length of the game never really bothered me. But. You know, they're trying to appeal to the masses rather than just the diehard fans, because the way baseball is, is that baseball is a sport that it's very hard to catch the casual fan. It's baseball is a sport that's passed down to you. You know, it's something that you you grow into being a fan of. You don't just turn the TV on one day and say, oh, 
I like that. Okay, I'm gonna watch it. It's it's something that's it's passed down to you, like as a gift. So um, it, you know th- them trying to appeal to the casual fans. I get it. I mean, we're gonna see how it goes. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of kickback. Um, we've already seen in spring training in regards to that that pitch clock. It's you know it's a little it's a little wonky. So you know there's gonna be a little a lot of things that they're gonna have to work out. Um, the the big base. Ah, you know, that that's not a big deal for me either. Um, the problem that I have, the shift I've always had a problem with, but mm-hmm. the biggest problem that I have with baseball is the analytics part of it has caused all of those things to be an issue, right? Mm-hmm. So they taught guys to stop hitting the other way, stop and start hitting for power, getting on base. So think about it. If you, if you have a regular guy that hits for contact, and he's not a he's not a power guy. And they put a shift on him because he, he's normally a pull hitter. His intelligence is going to say, OK, the whole left side is open. I'm just going to be able to take the ball that way and get myself a double or a triple. But what they're taught now at the lower levels is that strikeouts are fine. Get on base yeah. and you just have to hit yeah. hit the way you're, you, you've always hit. That's not baseball. We have to get and I think they're trying to get back to baseball stolen bases you can't throw over you know for a certain amount of time all of those things are okay it, it's okay but analytics is why those things have kind of decreased why stolen bases have gone yeah. down why uh you know contact hitting has gone down why batting averages have dropped why uh pitchers don't throw they don't they don't pitch anymore they throw so you know there's a lot of things that have changed and analytics is the cause of that so yeah. you know we'll we'll see how this works but Analytics are still yeah. here, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah Barry, that's, more to talk, that's such more a good point. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to add that's such a good point, Barry, because it, it's it's you know trying to dissect every single part of the game and the beauty about it. And when I bring new people in to watch baseball a little bit, it's like, okay, what the pitcher is going to try to throw something and he's going right. to try to fool the hitter. Yes. The hitter is going to try to pick up what he's going to throw him and catch up to that ball and hit it. Um, it's it's that kind of game of of trying to catch the other guy off guard or try to fool him with a pitch. Yes. But it's so detailed now, and, and the analytics mean that we don't get to see the Tom Seavers go for right. nine or ten innings if it's right. a close game. They're finished in six, and it's unfortunate because they've they've dissected the game so much. It yes. has slowed it down because of that substantially. Games didn't used to be three hours and forty minutes long. Right. Uh, right. But there's so much to it now that um, that it had slowed it down because of that. So, Barry, I, I agree. I hope it gets back to maybe the way it was where it's more about pure baseball and, and right. trying not to read so much into it, just being able to play the game and have fun at it that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's both of you made such a good point about that. Uh, I just I just wanted to go back to, uh, you know, the purity and the greatness of baseball. Uh, it had become just a home run or strikeout every time a guy came up to bat. And, you know, a lot of people were very frustrated with that. And it was becoming frustrating. It wasn't showing all the aspects of the game. It, it used to be these five tool players. And, you know, you want to be able to see all the tools, not just a total shift. The guy hits either, you know, get gets him into the shift, strikes out or home run. Uh, right. That's the only three options. That didn't seem like, uh, yeah. you know, baseball that would attract new people and, and people that were part, you know, fans of the game were starting to turn away from it as well because it wasn't really ball baseball anymore like we grew up watching it. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Um, the, and, and Go ahead, Dale. I was going to say, guys like McNeil and Guillaume were fun to watch last year when there was a shift on because you knew that they could go to the left side Absolutely. of the field. And there Absolutely. was a lot open and other guys as well. And take advantage of it, and and um, yeah, you know, kind of use right. that to their strength. Could you could know? you imagine if 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 the if this shifting was such an adamant you know uh, tool back in the mid eighties, guys guys would hit three ninety. Yeah. They would like it, they would have been it's, able to find the hole every yeah, time. It was just yeah. like, are you kidding yeah. me? Like this is easy. So you know, it, the, the game is an easy game, and what I mean by easy game is just. Don't try to confuse it too much. I understand that advanced metrics and cyber metrics, all of these things, they can help you put together a roster. They can help you figure out certain combinations or that, that a pitcher uses. But the game itself, 
is the game. You can't change it. You can't change the mechanics of somebody throwing a fastball or a splitter or a changeup. Those things don't change. But what they're trying to do is, like like Dale said, they they lengthen the game so much because the bullpen is such a an extensive use now. It used to be starting pitching was starting pitching. You're going to get seven, eight innings out of your starting pitcher, mm -hmm. and you turn it over to the bullpen, and hopefully you, you can be able to get a win. Or you get complete games. Complete games nowadays is it's it's a it's a unicorn. Like you know, guys get five complete games in a season. That's a lot. Yeah. But five five complete games fifteen to twenty years ago, you look at that like you only have five. Like what what, what type of season are you having? So you know it's <laughs> it's 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 crazy how much the little things have changed when they really didn't have to. Yeah. So you know. Now they're now they're seeing the error of their ways. Oh, we need more stolen bases. We need this and that. Like you know, guys like Ricky Henderson couldn't play now. Yeah. You know, so it, it's it. Those things are really really they important, really man. And and I'm hoping that they can just get back to like we all said, just the fundamentals of baseball. And it, it's the very simple game. game. Yeah. There, there, it's, it's, it's a there was a, there was cool. zero there was zero thirty for thirty guys last season. I think right. this year we're going to see half a dozen or yeah. more. Uh, I think I kind of wish I would have convinced people to start the shift when I played because I would have hit 400. <laughs> I, I always and hit where they weren't. <laughs> I looked up when I got walking up to the plate. I saw, okay, this guy's good. That guy's good. I'm going right. to hit here. Uh, there's a hole here. I'm hitting it there. And I always did. And I always, and that was my, my skill. I wasn't a home run hitter. I knew right. where they weren't. My, my guys that I loved that I really respected were guys that hit. 350 yeah. every year will yeah. get on base yeah. and do their job. And, and, you know, I, I kind of wish the ship was around when I was hitting and I, maybe I made that. Made Absolutely. The goal, but, yeah. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Uh, the other, You'd be in the New other, York with Barry right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Playing for the Yankees. Yeah. That would have been good. <laughs> yeah. Um, th there's been a, a, a change also that sort of because of these rule changes that I really like. Uh, the pitchers are finally calling their pitches instead of having the catcher call the game. I wish that it happened so long ago. I always hated that the pitcher would be standing on the mound and the catcher would put his signs down and he'd shake his head and he'd shake his head, shake his head. And then catcher would have to go back to the signal. And then catcher would get frustrated, go out to the mound, <laughs> say, Hey, what the hell, man? I told you, you want to you throw me a curve. No, I'm throwing you a fastball. I, my heater's going. And, you know, I don't understand why the game was always like that. I wish the pitcher always called the games, and I think this is going to be great. Uh, we get to see him, you know, flex his muscles and get in there and, and play his game. He doesn't have to rely on the catcher to know what, what the tendencies are for the hitter. I'll, well, I'll jump in first. Yeah, I agree, Darren. I think it's – it's. Uh, I mean, it's been part of the game as well, and obviously the catcher flashing a sign to the pitcher – shows all the infielders, especially what's coming up so they can try to adjust as well. So they still have to account for that with catcher calling what the pitcher wants, but it does get frustrating. And, and you see the guys roll their hands that they want to go through it again um, because they didn't like what they saw the first time. It's going to be the same array of pitches the second time around, but, but hopefully it speeds things up a little bit more. It's just that one little part that uh, it's almost playing a game with the batter as opposed to just selecting a pitch and throwing the ball. Yeah. Yeah, Barry. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I don't have a big problem with it. I didn't have a big problem with it before because it was just kind of, uh, you know, it was funny to me where there was some disconnect and then the, and then the catcher. Like, All right, let's let's just get on the same page here because you know catchers yeah. are pretty much the managers on the field, right? Yeah. Like they're they're the ones that command everything. Yeah. They see everything. They 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 have to line up with their pitcher. So I didn't really have a problem with it. But if this is gonna be able to just minimize that miscommunication. And just keep the game flowing at a at a at a reasonable pace. Then there's no reason to have it. So that that's that's one of those like things that the little nuances that you're not gonna really see, but it's gonna make a difference, right? So yeah. I, I I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Matt, do you agree with me that we're going to look back years and years from now and say, oh, you remember that year 2023 when they put in all those new rule changes, the pitch clock, the no shift. Do you think this is going to be something historic this year? I think there's going to be shifts and changes in the rules, but 
do you think, you know, 20, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we're going to be 2023. What a crazy year that was. Um, very, very. Oh, okay. Yeah, very, go first. Uh, I think it depends on how the year goes, okay. right? Yeah. You know, there's certain things that will, if, if certain real crazy things happen, like, you know, there's some games that get, really uh affected by the pitch clock or the the pitcher is not looking at the batter while he's in the box and then something ha- like you know like if, if it happens mm-hmm. too consistently where there's a problem then it's going to go down in infamy right but if it goes smoothly yeah. then people are going to look at it like okay this is this was a moment in time where baseball got back to what we we're trying to get it to 15 years ago. Right. And we just didn't know how to get it there because the people that were in power were too, were too stubborn and too, you know, just not really seeing the game needed to be changed in these ways. So, you know, it can go either way. It can, it can be one of those, Oh man, this is really going to be bad. Or it can be the turning point that we're going to start getting some healthy baseball for the next decade plus. Yeah. What about you, Dale? Yeah. You think uh, we're going well, to remember 2023 think, for a long time? Yeah, I think every sport needs a reset at times, and maybe right. we're we're kind of at that point that that it's it's um, the games have gotten longer for a lot of reasons, which we've all talked about. But but that has implications from maybe drawing new fans from from a television part of it with uh, with games broadcast, and now if it's if it's an hour longer what, than what it used to be, everybody's got to account for it. Um, maybe gives them more time to sell ads so they don't complain too much but um uh but yeah i i i don't know if i think there's going to be other things that are going to come forward as well so i don't know if if 2023 will will kind of set the bar that way i i agree with barry that that we'll have to see how it goes i think i think the games will speed up this year because of the rule changes Mm -hmm. so that'll be looked at as a positive and and players will have adjusted managers will have adjusted at that point and then i think we're going on smooth the other ones um i don't know how much more i think i think the time of the game and, and the pitch clock is is the big one that everybody's watching out for but absolutely um if, it, if there's that adjustment and the games are a little quicker and, and the players uh are getting get used to it by the end of the year and then then yeah it will have had a positive effect and We'll certainly look back at 2023 and say that it kicked into gear then and, and the game is better because of it. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned um, off the top, uh, the first game that will uh, take place tomorrow, uh, we've got the Yankees facing the Giants. Uh, this is the first ever year where interleague play is immediate opening day. We've never had that. Uh, I, I, I've been a big fan of interleague play. I, I, I think there can be a lot of really great matchups uh, across baseball. Um, I think it's great. Are you guys happy that uh, it's kicking off even right from opening day? Yeah, I, I, I think so as well. I think it's, it's one of those things mm-hmm. where, you know, going back to just baseball being that traditionalist, right? They, they're, just, they're just so used to doing things one way that no matter how, what decade we got into, you know, no matter how clunky it got, they still stuck to it, right? Where this should have been done years ago. So I think it's going to allow, you know, other fan bases to see other players, you know, open up the market, have 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 new rivalries. So, you know, this is going to be something that's really, really good for baseball, and it should have happened a long time ago. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Dale? Uh, Well, and and we all grew up, uh, you know, in an era where, yeah, we're National League fans, we're Mets fans, National League fans, there's Yankee fans. So you would focus more on the one league as opposed to the other. You'd watch all your team playing those teams. Right. Um, so you got used to it. And there's something special about that, I guess. It, it meant that you wouldn't see that other team from, from the American League until the World Series, if that's what it got to. Um, but I do appreciate the fact that the you know, in the Mets case, they do move around. The fact that I'm five hours or four hours from Seattle during your couple hours. So we get to go down there. And, and for me, it's the closest thing I can get when the Mets do come to Seattle, right. which is rare, but it's still an opportunity or to travel down the coast to California and see them when they play the Angels or right. or the Oakland A's. 
Um, so it opens it up. And like, I think Barry, you make a good point that the fans get to see other teams. If, if you've got a powerhouse in, in, uh, uh, the American League, National League teams and fans want to see those those players and those teams as well. So Absolutely. I like where it's headed. I like the fact that they're playing against each other. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So last week, Barry, I'm watching your podcast and you start talking about baseball. You guys don't cover baseball too, too much because I know you're uh, usually you, the guys that you have for guests. I'm and, the only Mets fan. Yeah, I'm the only uh, baseball guy. All fans, but uh, <laughs> you started off your rant by saying, I hate baseball and yeah. i'm like uh oh what the hell uh should i have asked barry to be a <laughs> podcast or not i hate baseball came out of your mouth and then you looked over and said i know you hate baseball but for a different reason than i hate baseball but let me get tell you why so uh your rant was about the wbc edwin diaz uh getting yeah. injured there and yeah. uh you very unhappy about this tournament uh it was one of the greatest baseball tournaments that's ever been played, if not the greatest, greatest assembly of talent uh, worldwide. All these guys got to put their nation's jersey on, and uh, the games were phenomenal. It came down to an absolute classic, Shohei Otani against Mike Trout in the final, final at bat. I mean, it was awesome. I loved it. Lots of my friends loved it, but you hated it. Be, yeah, if if Diaz doesn't get hurt, I don't know. Maybe you don't hate it as much, but uh... <laughs> I, I I would I, I would disagree. You see, the thing is with me is that I haven't watched the World Baseball Classic since its inception. Okay. Um, I think it's a great tournament. I think it's I think you know it's a tournament that can be able to uh, allow international fans to really get behind their teams. And to, you know, come to the States and be a part of it and, and just just be able to embrace how that playoff atmosphere feels, right? The thing with me is that the reason why I don't like it is because of when it's played. And I understand that it's it's very hard to find a perfect place to put it. Mid-season really doesn't work, right? End of the season probably doesn't work either because you have a lot of guys who they're not in baseball mode. They don't really want to play competitive baseball after the season. You know, you have the Dominican league or the winter league, a lot of guys playing that, but traditionally guys shut it down. They don't want to deal with that. So I understand that there's, there's not a perfect place to put it. My thing is that as and I'm just going to speak for myself, anecdotally baseball is our game. So I am fixated on spring training. I'm fixated on getting my getting the season started. I'm not really fixated on the World Baseball Classic. I'm not. So that's that's why for me it's it's I don't particularly like it, but everybody else does and I will never fight anybody on that. I'm not going to say, "Oh, well, I don't know why you watch that stupid World Baseball Classic." Just not for me. But I I like the fact that the competition is great, but I'm just very hesitant because you're asking these guys to play high level baseball when they're trying to ramp up for their season. It's very, very weird. And that's why certain guys get hurt. Of course, they're not going to blame it on the world baseball classic injuries happen all the time, but more injuries will happen when your body's trying to ramp up faster than it should. So, you know, those are the things that I don't like about it. And for Edward Diaz, obviously it was a freak injury, but it's just like he got hurt there. He didn't get hurt in his house. He didn't get hurt in, in Port St. Lucie. He got hurt there. So I understand a lot of Met fans like me in the moment were very upset about that. So, you know, that's where I was coming yeah. from. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Dale? You, uh, you, you said it all right there, buddy. You said it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm unhappy because I didn't like the uh, Team Canada uniforms one bit. Hey, oh, so my good. How can you How can you be so cheap? Hey, get get some good jerseys. Come on. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, 
you know, I was I was excited about it to some degree. And like you, Barry, I hadn't really watched much in the past years yeah. when they had it. And it's been a few years since the last one. I got into it a little bit more, not even as much to see the Mets guys play with their various teams, but I kind of wanted to watch Canada a little bit from yeah. here. I wanted to, um, you know, there's a lot of up and coming players. Uh, Freeman's playing with Canada, so you could get excited about it a little right. bit more as well. Um, so I was excited to watch Canada when they bowed out. I, I mean, a, partly a busy schedule, watched a little bit here and there and, and had a hockey game the night of the, the championship game. So, uh, wasn't able to watch that and just could look at highlights later, but there's no right time to get there either. I, I, the, at the beginning or the middle of the season and Darren and I were talking before we started the podcast or the end of the season, I don't really think works. Right. Um, if, uh, if you're if uh, a player gets injured and Altuve got injured as well, Houston right. Astro fans aren't going to like the WBC too much either. So if you don't get a player injured from your team, you're not complaining too much. But I think it's the playing at the high level too early in the season, which is the issue that has to get talked about and sorted out somehow because you're just not used to doing it in spring training games. Now you're playing for your country. You want to show well and you want to get people in your country excited about it. And you're playing at a high level when maybe it's just too early in the season. That would be Absolutely. my talk about it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I've always had a problem when uh, the World Series champion wins and they say this is the best team in the world. And they just, uh, you know, say we are the world champions. And I'm like, no, actually, <laughs> no, you're, you're playing uh, in, in U.S. and Canada. You're not playing the world here. So that's something that always frustrates me. And I, I do love seeing best on best. And I do love seeing people playing for the pride of their nation. A lot right. of times you see a guy uh, walk up to bat and, and play and you don't know his background. You don't know that he's Puerto Rican or Dominican or True. Yeah. where he's from, Cuba or yeah. whatever. And so uh, it's kind of wild to s suddenly see, oh, okay, this th these guys are from this region of the world. These guys are from this region. Uh, you, you saw the fans come out en masse. I think it attracts a lot more people to baseball, I think. When you have this, yeah. because it's a good point. Sudden, you're, you're suddenly yeah. getting to cheer for your home town, home country guys. And you're, you know, that's, that's very important in sports. I think it unites people uh, that regular sports uh, just doesn't when you're playing for your nation. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, for the people that, that, that do love it and they enjoy it, go ahead and have fun with it, man, you know, embrace it. It's, it's, it's great competition, I see, but it's just it's just not for a lot of people. And that's fine. You know, I, I think it's more for the international crowd. I think the international crowd really, really, really takes it in. And the players, they they buy into it as well. They've you know, they're they're very, very prideful about representing their country. And and I can't be mad about that at all. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I think it quickly to wrap up from my part, it, it opened up your mind a little bit more to where these players were from, which is it, yes. which was interesting. Great Even point. Freddie Freeman, to find out both his parents were born in Canada. He was born in the States, but both his parents were Canadian. Um, I didn't even I didn't know that. It's just not something I'd looked at before right. until it was like, hey, Freddie's playing for Canada. Go and dig right. up his background a little bit more. So we found out about more about players, more about their background, who whose parents grew up in the Netherlands. Most of these players didn't, but their parents right. did, and that qualified them for it. But, um, yeah, it opened up your mind a little bit more as to where the guys are from and, and some of their backgrounds. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Barry, we, we have seen a dramatic drop over the years for the black baseball player. Last year, there was only a little over 7% uh, black players playing in Major League Baseball, and that's obviously got to take a hit on the fans. Uh, black fans that uh, probably have turned away from the sport with lack of representation and heroes that they can see that look like them. Uh, you've maintained yourself as a fan. I, I assume that uh, some of your black uh, friends and people that you associate with have turned away from baseball or don't watch baseball because there isn't that representation anymore. Uh, do you see a, a, a change? Do you see it, the ability for uh, baseball to be integrated a lot more. Uh, Jackie Robinson is always a shining example. Finally, you know, broke the color barrier and all that. But um, it's strange how the game has shifted away and we're seeing uh, less and less black players all the time. 
Well, I can definitely tell you that it, it's been something that has bothered me. Um, I would say for the last 20 years, I've seen the decline, right? Um, you know, just a personal story. I mean, when I started watching baseball, you know, the first person that jumped off my screen was King Griffey Jr. Nice. And I, I asked my cousin, I said, who, who is that guy that's just running and catching everything in the, in the, in the outfield? And he's like, oh, that's that they call him the kid. I said, well, that's not my favorite player. And then I saw Barry Bonds. I was just like, well, why is this guy just better than everybody else? Why is his bat speed better than everybody? So you saw guys that look like me that were superhuman, right? And they were they were well advertised. Frank Thomas, the big hurt. I mean, the list goes on. Tony Gwynn, all of these great players like, you know, Fred McGriff, all so many great players that played this game and the reason that I'm seeing that there's been a decline is that Major League Baseball has put all their resources internationally. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, you, you've seen a lot of great players that have come from international, um, you know, countries. Yeah. So they tend to put their scouts, their resources into those particular countries, and they're generating all of these great players that are coming back to the, to the game. That's great. That's amazing. Now we're seeing the, the Japanese market starting to really open up now and you're starting to get more great players coming in from there amazing right they have a pipeline there now the problem is that they have put all of these resources in all of these other places and they've taken away the resources from in their own state from in the in, in, in the in the united states in regards to there's no more baseball diamonds in the inner cities anymore because baseball is expensive right, right. a lot of a lot of parents they don't have the money to put their kids in baseball. They don't have their, the money to put their kids in travel baseball. So what is the remedy to that? Well, your major league baseball, put some money and some resources together and start building some fields back into the inner cities, start promoting black players on TV they, you know, just baseball players in general are not, they have no endorsements. There's no advertisements. There's no TV things. There's nothing that shows a child, that looks like me growing up in the inner city, that there's a sport named baseball that they can be able to play. Every other sport has that. So there, there's a big problem in regards to how they're marketing the sport, not to just the masses of every race, but especially to African-American kids and, and, and mothers and, and, and single parent homes or whatever it is. It's just not appealing and you have to make it appealing. You got to put the resources back here and they've taken it away. This is why, they put Ken Griffey in the front office to try to figure it out and try to see what he can be able to do to try to, you know, get some get some buzz or generate some some interest back yeah. into the inner cities. Because let's be honest, some of the greatest players that we've ever seen play this game are African-Americans. So the fact that you're having such a such a, a decrease in that particular um, category of, of, of race of people, that's a problem. It's a concern. And that's something that they should be putting and pooling all of their resources to try to figure it out and try to generate and get this sport back to appealing to everybody because it used to. So, no, that's an amazing perspective. I I really appreciate so much of of yeah what what you said there. That's uh, very astute and and uh, incredible. Yeah, let's hope that uh, they wise up and and uh, really understand the need for for it. Uh, you know to. Uh, help keep growing the sport and making it such a great sport. Um, Dale, you, you have more to add to that? Well, I was getting, and Barry's in the heart of it right now. So he, he sees that much closer. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Saskatchewan. We, we played hockey in the wintertime. We played baseball in the summertime. Those were right. the two sports. He had some high school sports in there, but um, there were a lot more kids. There were teams at every level, every town around had a team. You played against them. That just doesn't happen anymore. Society's changed in a lot of yes. ways to dictate that. Yeah. All I, all I want to add is that, you just want kids to have the chance to play the game. Yes. They love. And, and yes. if it's baseball, money shouldn't get in the way. Um, I had parents that, that supported and drove me to the games and everything. Um, but you just want kids to have the opportunity. I, I've coached baseball in the past and it's so much fun being, being a part Absolutely. of their lives and, and adding something to it. Just yeah. give them the chance to be able to play, keep the right. fields open, have uh, volunteers in the community that want to be there for them as well. And, 
give them a chance to play. That's the important absolutely thing. just 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 put the resources into yeah. in, into these these communities that need baseball diamonds, man. It, it's not yeah. you know it it sounds obviously it's not as easy as that, right? But but you know you have all of these teams. They have you know every team has a pool of money. You know whether it's the luxury tax stuff yeah. that they can be able to. You know, the small markets, put that back into your inner cities, put that back into your communities, you know, sponsor a lot of these a lot of these baseball leagues and and have all of this equipment be able to be free for these kids to be able to use. You know, it's I don't think that that's a big ax from Major League Baseball that generates over a billion dollars a year. So, you know, there's there's a lot of things that they can be able to do. It's about want to. Right. It's there's a lot of gaslighting. That's been happening in baseball over the past 20 years. Yeah, we want to fix it. Oh, it's a big concern. We see the numbers dropping. What are you doing to actually fix it? Nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they got to make yeah. a monumental shift and change. Very, very good point. Uh, I'm glad you brought up yeah. Ken Griffey, one of my favorite players. I got to see him perform here for Seattle Mariners. Got to see him live uh, so much in my life. And one of my favorite all-time players as well. It was really cool to see him as the hitting coach for the U S in the world baseball classic. And he even got into the cage and hit a couple. Oh yeah. In, in <laughs> there, which was, he still got it. <laughs> still got it. Yeah. Same age as me. And uh, I don't think I'm uh, cranking out home runs in major league parts these days. He still, he still has that sweet swing. And uh, oh, it, was a, it was a pleasure to watch him uh, even performing at this age. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't teach that swing, man. It was just, just seeing him in the cage with his hands back and he's rolling the bat. I'm just like, man, like just you, you, you took it for granted how great he was when he played. And, you know, when he left Seattle, went back to Cincinnati because he wanted to go back home, you know, we, we saw him get hurt. We saw him have these string of injuries over the last few, you know, the like, like maybe three or four years in a row, he, he wasn't finishing out seasons. And I think that, in itself really changed the way people looked at Ken Griffey. Right. Like they, he wasn't, he wasn't looked at in the same breath anymore. He did. He, he wasn't looked at like a, like a, like a, a gigantic monumental historical guy anymore, but then, you know, he started to get his footing back and he's finished his, he finished his career with 630 home runs. Could you imagine if the guy didn't get hurt? what he would have done, yeah. he would have probably yeah. been an 800 home run guy. So, you know, those things, it just goes to show you that, you know, you just have to appreciate guys for when they're playing, man. He was a joy to watch. He was always smiling. He, he made the game fun. He, he was really one of the, the, the first guys back in the nineties to really like change how people are looking at baseball, where the younger generation can really like take to a guy and he can be able to be generational. He had sneakers that still sell to this day as, as <laughs> you know, as popular as, as, as Jordan's. So those are yeah. things that he has impacted the game. And, you know, you got to get back there somehow. You have to get back that essence of baseball that he created. And that's why they asked him to be the ambassador and try yeah. to fix it yeah. because he was the guy that turned the tables and made – the youth and the, the 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 black community like myself, mothers saying, you know what, that kid is cool. I want my kid to play baseball. Yeah. So, you know, his his legacy, his stamp on the game will never be forgotten. And, you know, it, it, anytime you watch clips of King Griffey Jr., it just brings a smile to your face, honestly. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and for us being in BC and seeing a lot of Seattle Mariners games going way back. I mean, it was so much fun because he was, he was such a part of it. And, yeah. and they were a franchise that was growing at that point, yeah. um, you know, from, from their early years and, and also growing into a much better team as well. And he was a right. big part of that. So right. it, was, it was fun being here. We got uh, the bonus of seeing highlights every night oh, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and, and seeing him as a young baseball player grow. And, you yeah. know, that's a cool thing. We all have idols. I mean, Tom Seaver is my favorite player. Oh, player. I remember man. reading his book when I, when I was in, junior high probably and loved Tom Seaver there and became a New York Mets fan. I was kind of an Expos fan before that because of the Canadian team, but Absolutely. I became a Mets fan and it's been a lifelong thing, but it's from reading Tom Seaver's book and, and he was kind of my idol in that way. 
but I had, and I was a pitcher in baseball, so I had somebody to try to emulate a little bit. And I think he was always such a class guy, uh, along with his baseball talents, just a class guy away from the field as well. And and he was a guy that you could really kind of fall in love with as a baseball player, as a human being because of that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well yeah. said. I was really sad when Ken Griffey went to Cincinnati. Uh, I know he went there because of his uh, tie to his father's roots and all that. And it was it was kind of cool, but it was really sad for the Pacific Northwest here, uh, you know, losing that talent and a guy that you got to see every day on the local channels. And it was tough. Uh, I think uh, Cincinnati fans are probably ruining the day they ever brought him in because uh, on July 1st, he gets another 3.6 million every year. Yeah. He has been collecting 3.6 million every year since 2009. And his, the last payment they have to pay him is next year. So, uh, he had 55 million in deferred salary that he's been collecting every year, and they, the Cincinnati fans, have to see that on their payroll every year after year after year. Like you guys have to see Bobby Bonilla still getting paid yeah, yeah. years later. This Evans from Baltimore, he's getting huge money still. Oh yeah. my goodness! Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, so, but yeah, Ken Griffey, an uh, incredible guy, and uh, I'm I'm so glad that they finally made a very smart move. Uh, you know, bringing him as an ambassador. Um, you reminded me quite a bit, uh, Barry, of Pat Gillick, who was the general manager of the Blue Jays when the Blue Jays won their two World Series championships. Uh, he went to Philly. He went to Seattle. When he went to Seattle, I covered the Mariners on a day-to-day, -day, everyday basis. I got to talk to Pat Gillick every day and really realize how much of a genius he was about the game. And the, the thing that changed the Jays' fortunes was they started sending scouts to different um, different countries than a lot of the other major league teams had. And he got some talent from San Pedro de Macaris, and suddenly that just complemented the core they had and gave them those two World Series championships. When he went to Seattle, uh, now every single major league team had scouts in all those other countries where... They had become hotbeds. He reached into Japan and he was able to get the, the next two rookies of the year. He got Ichiro. He was able to get Japanese talent over and really uh, end up turning that franchise around. They won 116 games uh, a couple of years after he arrived there. And he was able to really see a, a niche, uh, an ability to get talent from places where the other teams weren't getting them. So We've got to get somebody that wants to get the talent from the inner cities and Absolutely. really start stacking them, winning a, a championship or two, and then everybody will follow suit. Absolutely. I, I mean, you know, it's it, you know, sports is definitely a uh, copycat league, right? right? So, you know, you want to see um that happen. I I listen, I am hoping that that day happens where we're getting more influx of talent from everywhere. Not just not just internationally, but here in the States, too. You know, we have a lot of great players that are are in Canada, that are in the United States. So, you know, make sure that you put the pipelines, you put the resources there to get these guys seen and and have these guys on TV, commercials, sponsorships. You know, that let let people know that there's baseball players that play professional sports and that they're cool as well. You like, you know, what I mean, like, you know, I, I remember years ago when Mookie Betts won the MVP for the Red Sox, I was so happy. And there was not one national commercial for the kid. Not one. Wow. That's, and and, that's and wrong, that's the, that's where baseball has been. Mike Trout can walk down the street right now and nobody would know who he is. Crazy. So that's, that's a problem. That's a problem. People have to understand that this is one of the best hitters of any generation. Right. Mm -hmm. And for him to not be marketed the way that he should be marketed, you know, it, it, it looks bad on the sport. It's bad yeah. on the sport. Yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. and uh, just to add to what you were talking about a little bit before Barry in that um, this is, this is sports, it's baseball and players have a finite amount of time yes. to play the game at this level. Um, buddy guy can still put out great music at 80 something right. uh de niro can still act and and you know there's differences from from music and and um and the movies and, and acting and everything but sports 
uh, it's about your body and how long your body can play at that high level to to be able to produce and and it can't be easy for some of these players they may see things declining a little bit but uh, up here you still got it and you right. still want to play and you still want to perform uh, Daniel Murphy just signing with uh, uh, with the, the team Ducks. today to go yeah. with uh, uh, Ruben Tejada um, you know he still wants to play he says yeah I still got the the urge to play and and the desire to play um, but again, they're they're pro athletes, and there's only a limited time. So you you want to be able to accomplish what you can, but it's a short window. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I've spent my entire life having to try to defend baseball. Uh, a lot of people just immediately say, "No, I don't like it. I'm not a fan." They have their reasons. They you know they say boring, too slow, da 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 da. They all have reasons. What? If somebody tells you they're not a baseball fan, what do you tell them? Uh, the reason why you're a fan and why they should give it a shot. Barry, uh, what uh, what happens when somebody immediately comes to you and says, no, nah, I don't like baseball. I, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to really watch it. And you really want to you know, expose them to it. Well, the first thing that I would tell them, Darren, is come with me to see a game. Nice. Yeah. Come with me to see a game. If you don't like it, then you don't like it. But ex- you need to experience what it feels like to be in a ballpark. You need to experience what it is to actually understand the game, understand what you're Mm -hmm. seeing, seeing the game within the game. You know, you know, me and Dale were talking, obviously, about the the nuances of the mental game between pitcher and hitter like that is that is the game. It's it's a cerebral game. And if you're somebody who's into things like that, if you watch movies that are very cerebral, you have to think. Baseball is going to be something that appeals to you. Yeah. So that's yeah. my thing is that, you know, people, it's just like when people say they don't watch hockey. Don't watch hockey. I dare you to go to a hockey game, sit there for yeah. three periods and say that this and wasn't that. some of the most exciting stuff that you've ever, if you've ever watched in your life, because yeah. there's no yeah. sport on planet earth that's better than a live hockey game. It isn't watching a game yeah. live. There's nothing better. So, you know, it's just about what people are exposed to, what people are uh, conditioned to be exposed to or conditioned to like. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people don't like things because the masses don't like it because they grew up everybody not liking baseball. So it's cool to not like baseball when you've never even given it a chance. So, you know, it's one of those things where you really have to just try it, expose yourself to it. And you you, you never know what happens. No. Well, and, and I would add that to me, it's it's and I'll, I'll talk for hours with somebody new to 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 let them know the great things about the game from what right. I see. But to me, it's one of the 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 main sports, major sports. It's a team game, but it's yes. also about individuals. Right. Um, you hit the ball to center field. It's up to Brandon Nimmo to catch that ball. It's it's the batter and him. Essentially, it's it's still a team game where everybody works together. But. When you're at the plate, it's pretty much you facing that pitcher, you by yourself. Uh, when you're standing in center field and the ball's hit to you, it's up to you to catch the ball. So the individual aspect of it uh, with the team game thrown in and, and yeah, I just love the strategy about it. When, I, yes. when I'm watching a pitcher throwing to a batter and, and I remember sitting with some friends a while, a few years ago and saying, okay, he's, He's gonna. He just threw one inside to him. He's gonna throw a ball that's gonna go away from him here to try to get him to swing at, or or go up high because he just threw a low one, or or a curveball after a fastball or something. But the strategy involved every single pitch, and there's a, a few hundred pitches thrown every game. To me, is just something that is beautiful to watch, and and the fact that it's outdoors in summertime for the most part at most stadiums, um, when it's beautiful outside. The elements don't come into play as much, especially in the heart of the season. And and it's outdoors with a lot of green grass. Uh, there's just many, many great things about the game. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, ju- and just to add to Dale's point, I mean, like the the, I think baseball more than any other sport, the suspense of baseball is greater than any other yeah. sport because you yeah. just never know what's going to happen. I mean, you know, I always go back and think about the the, the 2001 World Series. Right between the the Yankees and the Diamondbacks, when Young 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 Kim, bottom of the ninth in Yankee wow. Stadium, throws three straight games. I mean, you can't script that. That was some that was some some baseball that 
that somebody can just that that's a movie, right? Like so those things is what makes baseball great. Yeah. And yeah. you can't get you can't replicate that in any other sport. You really can't. And that's why baseball is just different. It's a different feel. It's a different emotion that you get from being a baseball fan for rooting for your teams because it's such a long season. There's ebb and flows in regards to production. Your team plays well this month. They don't play so well the next month, but there's always baseball the next day to be able to just, you know, forget about that terrible game. Or, you know, if you had a great game the the night before, you're going to hope that you get a great game tomorrow. So, you know, it's just, it's just the way the game is played, the way it's designed, the way it's structured. It's just it's just a beautiful game. And also, too, it's about the numbers. It's one of the it's yeah. one of the few sports that, you know, the other sports we talk about the numbers. But can anybody really tell me how yeah. many passing career yards that Aaron Rodgers has? Yeah. Nobody cares. Right. Yeah. Nobody, get, no, yeah. nobody really cares. But in baseball, everybody knows that when somebody is approaching that 500 uh, home run plateau, everybody understands when that guy is approaching 3000 hits. Everybody understands that, hey, this guy is hitting 350. This is a landmark, actually, a uh, uh, batting average for this season because he's probably going to be the batting champion. So all of these things, it matters. Like I remember when, you know, Ricky Henderson was stealing bases. Those things matter when you're stealing hundreds of bases a season. All of those things are – there's just so many different storylines within baseball throughout a season, throughout careers, that that's why it makes it great. And other sports don't really have that. Well, And and just one more thing to wrap up, Barry, that was great great comments. But like you mentioned, it it can go down to the final out in the bottom of the ninth inning, and you can be down three runs, but you got one or two guys on, you're never out of the game. Never out of the game. I think a lot of games. In hockey, if it's midway through the third period and and the team is down by four goals, the chances of them coming back are pretty slim. We've seen some right. NFL games in the playoffs where there are three or four touchdowns behind and, and came back, but it's pretty rare. In baseball, you can score four runs just like that. So you can be three or four runs down into the bottom of the ninth, and you're never out of a game. And we we've seen the Mets go both ways on that, where they right. ran up and lost them and <laughs> on the other way as well. So it's the heartbreak of it, but it's the beauty of it as well. Absolutely. So, yes, uh, I agree. Yeah, no. I, I remember uh, talking to a guy uh, when I was a teenager and he came to me and he gave me some unsolicited advice. And I was <laughs> like, uh, usually a lot of my buddies were idiots and they would, uh, you know, give me advice. And most of the time I completely ignore it and think, uh, <laughs> forget you, man. I know what you're saying, but, he, uh, he said that uh, if I ever really wanted to uh, prolong things when I was getting intimate, I just had to think of uh, ice cream, baseball, paint drying, <laughs> uh, <laughs> something like that. And and I'm like, uh, actually, baseball excites me. Uh, right. I, I, <laughs> I can't put that in there. Baseball at those moments. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would have been it would have been a quick night there it would have been a quick night. Yeah. would have had a lot of unhappy women in my life and uh i'm glad i really well, I'm, I'm, decided to not take his advice at all oh man that's funny i'm gonna add this really quick and this is probably going a little bit too far but with my ex-wife whether the match won or lost that night somewhat could possibly dictate what could happen later in the evening. So I'm just gonna stop right there. Listen, hey, hey, nice. Dale, I'm not gonna lie to you, man. I think baseball is the only sport that ruins my week. It ruins my week. If the Mets have a bad week, it ruins my week for everything. Wow. So you know, I'm, I'm with, with you, buddy. I'm with I'm you. With you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Let's talk, talk about the Mets. Uh, what an off season. Uh, we, you know. Steve Cohen has come in and really just shaken up this team. Uh, he has just really put the rest of the league on notice and has uh, had some unprecedented spending. Uh, with the luxury tax and all the other things that they're going to have to spend this year, it's going to be almost half a billion dollars that is going to come out of his bank account. And uh, he really has shaken up the league. I'm sure all the other owners are kind of mad at him. Uh, We've seen it in New York for many years with the Steinbrenners and, uh, you know, the dynasty that they have been uh, winning the most World Series championships. And that Yankee brand is just famous beyond belief and the money that just flows into their coffers. Finally, uh, on the other side of the city, we see the Mets 
uh, spending like the Yankees have over the years. And uh, this has really created a ton of excitement for this team. And I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what develops with this team and how they do. Uh, start, Barry, tell me about what it's like in New York. Steve Cohen has come in and really just uh, finally put the Mets at the top of the newspapers with all these deals and all this incredible talent that he's assembled. I mean, honestly, Darren, it, it's – I never thought that that day would come. I really had – like, you know, growing up a Mets fan and understanding that, you know, when the Wilpons took over, I was just like, all right, you know, we had some good years. But I, I always say, and I used to say on my show, that consistency starts starts at the top. If you have a chaotic front office, you're never going to be successful on the field consistently. You will have little drops of success here. But when we think about the Mets, they've never had three consecutive years or even in the playoffs. Think about that. They've never had three consecutive seasons of postseason play. That tells you that there's been a lot of inconsistency within the front office and with ownership. So now we have a guy. So we went from one extreme where, you know, the money wasn't there. They were operating like a small market team. You know, the, the, the Ponzi scheme happened, all that stuff. Great. Now we have a guy that's a fan that's willing to spend that understands the fans that's listening to the fans. He reminds me very much of George Steinbrenner without the crazy. Right. Because he understands what it takes to win. There's a passion to win. He is going to be relentless until he brings Queens a World Series. And that's what you want to see out of your owners. You want to see them improve the team. You want to see them compete for big time free agents and not penny pinch. You want to see them be able to retain their own guys and have guys um, really enjoy their experience being New York Mets. I remember in, in the offseason, I heard a reporter say that there's teams, there's GMs and players that are asking uh, Billy Epler, is it true? Billy Epler was like, what's true? Is it true about how players are treated in New York, about the culture just being completely different? People look at the Mets completely different, Darren. It's, yeah. it's a different atmosphere. Like, people look at the Mets as a – as a, a reputable organization, as a consistent, um, just great place to work. So those things we haven't really been used to, right? The yeah. spending, not really used to that. So it's a great time. And I, I don't have anything bad to say about Steve Cohen. I say it all the time on my Twitter, you know, probably every couple of weeks, protect Steve Cohen at all times. Um, you know, when you see him in the street, just make sure that he can cross the street. Uh, you know, with, there's no cars coming. Make sure that, you know, just make sure that he gets wherever he needs to go nice. safely. Nice. And, um, you know, Met fans around the world appreciate Mr. Cohen uh, more than we can ever put into words, obviously, because he's, you know, we're a loyal fan base. We're always going to be supportive of our Mets, no matter good, bad or indifferent. But it's all it's it's very reassuring and it's refreshing to know that you got a guy upstairs that cares and wants to spend and wants to make your team consistently good for, you know, decades to come, not just a two or three year window. So, you know, that, that's that for me, I, I can't ask for anything more as a Mets fan. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking, uh, yeah. Give any of us $18 billion uh, access to <laughs> oh, how my much goodness. fun would we have owning this right. team? Right. Um, Barry, you said it, he's a fan of the team, and, and that is just so cool to have. I mean, for years and years, um, you just didn't feel that at all. And, and uh, you know, there'll be off seasons where, yeah, I've, I've, I, lost, I, I lost my appeal for the Mets. I've always been a fan. I never went anywhere else, but I just lost some interest for yeah. a few years there. You weren't excited uh, for opening day as we're talking about as we are for tomorrow um, and partway through the season when they were having a terrible year uh, wasn't watching anymore and, and following them that closely but now it's a much different story you've got somebody that's that's got a vested interest not just from 
from his head and making money with the franchise and everything else that he's talking about in that area, but, but is a fan of the team and wants to see them win desperately, desperately bad. And, right. and that's just a cool thing to have any, any team that's got uh, an owner who's a fan of that team grew up in New York or, or whatever the city is and, and has the ability eventually to own that team. It's got to be a lot of fun. And, and he's around them all the time. The culture has changed and you're right there to see it, but, from afar, you you see all of that as well, and um, and it's a destination maybe for for players to go. Absolutely. I don't think you know money is one thing, but Verlander's not signing with the New York Mets if he doesn't get a good feel from his discussions with Steve Cohen and and thinking that you know what Max is there. They're signing other players that breeds more success and the ability to win as well uh, across the board. So it's a fun time for for that and. Is not going to go anywhere. He's just going to add more to it. The fact he's spending a lot of money, um, as he said a couple of months ago or a month or so ago, you know what? That's up. Uh, that's up to the other owners and the other teams to to spend their money as well. Absolutely. I've got the money. I'm spending it. I'm going to take a hit with a luxury tax later, but I'm going to give my fans the best team that I can for them to cheer for, and I'm going to give the team the best opportunity that I can to be successful. Absolutely. And um, and it's up to the other teams to to bring themselves up when some teams don't have an entire payroll that matches a Verlander or Scherzer or or some of the other guys there. That says something about what they think about their team and maybe their city as well. They've got to step it up a little bit. And I think Steve Cohen will will push everybody to be better. And maybe it's a better it's a better league and it's better baseball because of that, because everybody um, pushes themselves to to put more money into it and have better teams. Absolutely. hundred percent, man. And, and the one thing that I, I want to add about uh, Steve Cohen, about what what Met fans think about him is that he's personable. Like, you know, he yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of fans that have engaged with him and met him. And he's just a guy, you know, and, and that's that's what people love about him is that he truly, truly cares about seeing the Mets be great. And when you have an owner that has that mindset. How how can you not be a fan of the team if you're a fan of the team, right? You, you're of course you're gonna be, you know, gun ho. But even if you're a fan of another team and you're looking at this, you're like, man, I would really love to have more guys like this in baseball because I think if you have more people like this in baseball, baseball is gonna be in good hands and is gonna be able to take the next step into the next generation and be able to generate a, a another great fan base and have a have a you know a, a great decade of success that we've had yeah. you know back in back in yesteryear so you know that's yeah. that's what steve cohen represents and as a mets fan honestly you know i couldn't be more happier it, it's it's just yeah. it's a yeah. it's a surreal time it really is it, just, it feels weird you know but you know we're i think a couple more years of understanding who, who, who what what yeah. we're in we're gonna get used to it but right now, it's still like we're still in that honeymoon phase where it's just like, is this is this real? <laughs> like, is this really happening? Like, do are, are we in? We're in talks with every big free agent. Got Kodai yeah, single. Yeah. We got Verlander. We got Scherzer. You know, we almost got Correa. Like, it's just like, is this real? Like, you know, so yeah. it, it's just it's a beautiful time, and it really is. And and yeah. we are not taking it for granted. There's a lot of Met fans out there that are not taking this for granted. Trust yeah. me. Yeah, I'm. It, I'm it doesn't. Super happy, it doesn't mean you're going to win a championship. But they're right. not. Uh, yeah, if they win a championship, which uh, you know looks quite likely in the the coming years, if uh, they continue on this path, um, he he probably uh, runs for mayor and and wins hands down. Uh, yes, hands down. Hands yeah, down. seems to be a super <laughs> popular guy, and uh, I I've enjoyed listening to him and and seeing his philosophy. Um, I I always thought that Billy Bean was super bad for baseball. I really wish he would have just maybe had a jammer and left the game because, uh, you know, the <laughs> Oakland Athletics, uh, they've been a ridiculous example of poor management because every single time their player got to be good, they would just lowball them, lose them, and have to rebuild again and rebuild and rebuild. And I just thought that uh, Oakland has a perfect shining example just right there where the Warriors spend the money and they win four championships in the past eight yeah. years. 
and they were right there in Oakland. They were able to do it from a small market, and San Diego Padres are showing that as well. Uh, you spend the money, you attract the talent, and you start becoming a team that people talk about, want to play for, and want to take to World Series titles. And Peter Seidler, the owner of the Padres, is doing the same on the West Coast as we're seeing Steve Cohen doing on the East Coast. And Absolutely. It's uh, it's awesome to see these these owners take over these franchises and show the other owners this is the way you get up to the top. Not by penny right. pinching and being like Moneyball. Forget Moneyball. Let's play real ball and give the money to the players and the talent and bring them in. That's right. That's spend, spend like George. Spend like yeah. George and spend it all. <laughs> like, you know, you, 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 can, you can buy a World Series. We've seen teams buy a World Series in the last few seasons. So that's, that's the blueprint. Um, you can win the other way. There's nothing wrong with, with, with um, you know, Moneyball but it's not sustainable. Right. So, um, and the thing is, you know, the city of Oakland has a problem. I think the city of Oakland, they don't want to spend on any new arenas. They don't want to spend on any new ballparks. And, and that's a problem. That's why the Raiders left. Obviously they could have probably stayed, but you know, Vegas, Vegas had a, had a lot more to offer. Um, the, the golden state warriors, they had to leave Oakland and now they're in San Francisco. So, you know, those things right there, there's a lot of there's a lot of problems with the city of Oakland. And, and you know, hopefully some big money guy can be able to come in there and say, I grew up an Oakland A's fan. They're going to stay yeah. here and I'm going to spend and build a ballpark out of my own pocket. And I don't need any city funding from you guys. And I'm just going to be able to make it work. So hopefully we can get that because. The A's are a staple in baseball, and it would be really sad to not see them around. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, I'm I'm hoping that somebody comes along and buys them at some point. Well, and and Moneyball was a great movie. I've watched it many many times, and I love watching it every time. Great movie for the for the, the baseball part of it all. Um, but yeah, the story uh, the story hasn't gone any further. They haven't been able to to do anything with it, and. And I just feel for the fans there because yeah. if if it looks like you're not even trying to sign any players, uh, and money has to be an issue if if the owner is not going to kick in his own when you get uh, seven eight thousand fans a game, and sometimes it's not even close to that in Oakland. Um, as a player, are you going to get excited about going there? And and as we've seen with a lot of the players, once they get to that certain level where they're sought after by other teams, they're going to go somewhere else. Are you going to stay in Oakland and play in front of? seven eight thousand fans or go even just down the road to san diego where he is spending money and and they're gonna have great crowds i just saw something today about petco being named one of the the top ball, ballparks in major league baseball it's beautiful um it just it adds to it that much more you're gonna go to a team where you you can have something with the fans a rapport with them that they're excited about coming to the ballpark and watching you play and and that's just not the case in Oakland. Hey, I'm, I remember in the 70s, the Mets played the Oakland A's in, in uh, uh, what, 73, I believe it was. Um, but they had such great teams there and great, and it was a great franchise. You would never, ever expect it. It right. would get to the point where it is now where fans just don't care. You would have never seen that happen. Part of its ownership, part of it's the type of baseball that, that Billy Bean brought in. Um and you want to see a change. You want to see a change for the better because it's it's too good a city and too good a storied franchise to right. see it go away. Absolutely, I, I'm with you, man. I, I, you know they, they've they've been such great players, uh, such great history that they have there, and, and great mm -hmm. fans. That fan base yeah. is a rabid yeah. fan base. Like you know, just remember the Oakland Raiders. You know, just just you know the fact that there's no football in Oakland anymore. It's sad. So I, I don't want to see that happen in baseball. I want to see them be able to stay there and, you know, just hopefully somebody comes along and says, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe Jeff Bezos comes. Eh, I'd like to buy that team over there and see what's going <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, but, you better but, do it yeah. soon before they move to Vegas, though. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's that's definitely Which on might the table. not be a bad thing given, no, given the no. Raiders, their success and then Golden right. Knights as well. It's right. it's tough right. not to think that that wouldn't be a good thing for baseball and and probably for the fans and everybody else. But um, yeah, you still feel for Oakland and yeah. and want to see them survive somehow too. Absolutely, I agree, hundred percent. 
So baseball has uh, really has six divisions, has really the, the powerhouses in the East and the West, the Central. I, I find kind of boring, not, you know, not a lot of really exciting teams come out of the Central. So I really want to stick to the East to start with. I want to break down the a uh, NL East quickly by finding out, uh, do the Braves win their sixth straight division championship? Uh, are the do. Phillies going to compete uh, with with, the, with these two teams, the Mets and the Braves, again? Uh, who comes out of this? Do all three teams make the playoffs again? After last year, uh, the Braves and the Mets win 101. Uh, the Phillies win 85, and they go all the way to the final. How crazy was that? Uh, tell me about what's happening in this AL East in this crazy race between these top three teams. How about you, Barry? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think all three teams are in are, are are in a great spot. I mean, the Phillies went out and spend a lot of money in the off season. You know, they they went to go get um, you know, they got some pitching. They got the shortstop from um from the uh, what did they get? They got Seager, right? They Trey, get Seager. Trey Turner. They Trey got Turner. Him. Yeah, they got Trey Turner. So yeah. you know, they they have done exactly what they need to do to be consistently good. Um, they have guys at the top, Bryce Harper, Real Muto. So, you know, they, they just lost uh, Reese Hoskins, which is bad for them. Yeah. You know, that, that's a terrible loss for them. But they have enough to be able to, um, to, to, to still be good and generate a good season. Uh, it, it's going to be a dogfight. I, I think that between the three teams, they're going to beat each other up. I don't think that any team is going to win any more than maybe 97 games. I think 97 games wins that division. I don't think anybody wins 100 games, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be good teams. I think the Braves win over 90. I think the Mets win over 90, and I think the 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 um the the uh, Phillies come very close to winning 90. So all three teams make the playoffs, in my opinion, and it's really going to come down to September. It's really going to come down to starting pitching. Can the Mets starting pitching hold up? Um. Can the bats of the Philadelphia Phillies hold up during, down the stretch? Because their their pitching is not so great, so they rely more on their bats anyway. And the Braves, do they do, are they going to have a string of injuries that are going to you know uh, kind of prevent them from being great and take that next step? Is Acuna going to be able to come back and be the guy that he was pre injury? So it, there's a lot of things that 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 are that are on the table here, but I think that all three teams are gonna just beat each other up. But if you're gonna put a gun to my head in regards to who wins the division, I honestly believe that the Braves still. I, I think the Braves have the have the the leg up a little bit because of the Mets concerns. I think if there wasn't such such concerns with the Mets in regards to who's going to hit where and who's going to be hitting period in certain situations, then I think that I would be more sure with that because the thing is Starlin Marte is a superstar. That guy is amazing, but he can't stay healthy. The reason why the Mets collapsed in September was because he went down. So is he going to be able to stay healthy this season? If he stays healthy throughout the whole season, then I kind of lean Mets. If he has injury concerns, then I kind of lean Braves. So it, it, it's going to be one of those seasons for me, in my opinion. Nice. Yeah. Six six months down the road, we'll be able to look back at all this and, <laughs> and you know, I yeah, good points, Barry. I mean, it's there's so many variables these days, and and I think we're seeing many more players go down with injuries. Yeah. Um, and and uh it changes things drastically because of that. I mean, you know, the Mets, I think, were probably looked at a little bit more as maybe the favorite of those three, and Diaz goes down in the WBC, right. and that changes things. And all of a sudden, Hoskins goes down, and and Bryce Harper, there's still no guarantee when he comes back. So right. I, I think the Braves and the Mets are maybe a little bit closer than the Phillies, um, and maybe the Phillies are just that team that you don't want to admit is a pretty good team as well. Um, but yeah, I, they are going to beat each other up. It's going to be some great uh, series between those three teams uh, throughout the entire season. Um, if I'm going to say if the Mets pitching can really come through because I think the hitting is there. And I think if some guys don't hit, uh, some of these young guys have the opportunity to come up because I'd love to see a, a Vientos there, Alvarez. Absolutely. Bain, oh. Some of those guys. I mean, there's just so much talent. What do you do with them? And right. when when I know Darren and I started texting, you texted me at like six in the morning when they signed Correa. Uh, <laughs> I was still in bed. I got up. What are you seriously? Um, 
But I wasn't disappointed as much when it didn't happen because I thought, wow, I want to see these young guys in the lineup and I want to see what they can do. And there's so much talent there that I'm confident they will do something. They just have to bide their time a little bit. But I think there's pressure on the veterans if they don't perform, you know, Escobar and, and uh, uh, you know, maybe from a catching standpoint that they've got other guys to bring in there. Um, to push them a little bit more. So I, I like the Mets and I like their pitching. And I think of Verlander and, and Scherzer and, and Senga's that that wild card. If he comes in and is able to accomplish what everybody believes he can, I think the Mets pitching is strong. And I think that could that could lead them to first place. But again, I, I still see all three uh, with a good shot of making the playoffs and, and who knows where it goes from there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah great uh great insight i i uh love hearing all that and uh that's gonna be yeah they are gonna beat each other up that's gonna be the craziest race i think in baseball and uh super fun to watch uh you know such three such talented teams and all probably will be even spending more money and making acquisitions especially if they they have injury troubles uh i have a couple notes that i wanted to give um justin verlander will be the eighth multi-time Cy Young winner to pitch for the Mets. Uh, he joins this elite class. Listen to these guys. These are the guys that uh, I think about when I think about the Mets. We got Glavin, Pedro, Saber Hagen, uh, Johan Santana, Tom Sieber, Jacob deGrom, and Max Scherzer. Like, wow. Wow. those names are just synonymous from for the Mets. And uh, as all, the, all of those great names, and we only have two World Series titles to, to speak for it, huh? Yeah, how did uh, that happen? That's <laughs> the eight multi time Cy Young winners. That's four more than any franchise in baseball. Uh, so that's yeah. incredible. Uh, Verlander and Scherzer will be the third duo of three plus Cy Young winners to pitch for the same team in the same year. Wow, uh, they join uh, Scherzer and, and Kershaw in the Dodgers 2021. And Carlton and Seaver in 86 with the White Sox. Wow. So some yeah. pretty neat uh, note, notes there that uh, shocked me. And uh, um, when DeGrom left, uh, I was like, oh, no, that's tough. That's really going to be tough. Can you believe that they replace him with Verlander? Uh, that was just like, wow, holy crap. Like maybe yeah. even better other than being 40 um Verlander has just been incredible the last couple of seasons yeah uh, um I think you know obviously I think me and Dale kind of feel the same way when when DeGrom left it wasn't a shock yeah it no. was more of just very it was just disappointing how it happened right mm -hmm. um but the fact that this team this organization this front office was so quick to rebound and they had this in the, the 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 resource they had this in a tuck it just shows how how advanced they are how forward thinking yeah. they are that they have all of these things already lined up they already had this move waiting there in case a deal didn't then get struck with Degrom. and i just want to talk about the Degrom thing a little bit because you know that that was a big big uh issue when he did leave you know we heard different things about why it happened and how it happened. And, you know, he took a great deal in Texas and I hope that he can stay healthy and, and, yeah. and, you know, help them win. He's a great person. He's a great guy, but I just think that he, he got tired of the limelight in New York. Mm -hmm. I think the Grom, if you, when you think about who he is as a person, He's not New York. He's more Kansas City. He's more Texas. He's more Florida. He's not somebody that wants to have all of this stuff in his face and all of these media outlets and these reporters in his face. He just wants to pitch. And I think that you started to see New York weigh on him as the years progressed. Because if you remember when he came up, you know, the long hair, the big smile, you know, having fun in the dugout, it stopped being that for DeGrom. You stopped seeing the smiles. You stopped seeing – he stopped having the press access that he used to have. You know, his interviews got less. 
And those things, you started to see the regression of his time in New York. So it wasn't a shock to me personally, like obviously to the fan base, they were shocked, but I saw the tea leaves. You saw it, you, you saw it there. And the fact that a team came in and gave him a big deal, I was shocked that anybody would give him anything over five. So, um, you know, kudos to him. I, I hope he stays healthy, but the Mets, you know, they, they, they really did a good job. And the fact that they got Verlander and Verlander reminds me so much of, of, um, of Nolan that it's crazy. Like he, he's, he's Nolan Ryan, you know, Nolan Ryan was a guy that pitched into his mid forties and was still throwing 97. Yeah. 47. So, yeah. so yeah. It, you know, that he just was a guy that just continued to get better and learn and to adapt to the changing of the time, the changing of the guard in major league baseball. And he kept himself good. He kept his arm good. He, he, you know, he changed his diet after a while. He, he's, you know, he should change up his, his workout routine. The same thing Verlander is doing is that Verlander is very analytic based. He's, he's always trying to keep up with what's going on in the game, how to change, how to get better, how to elongate his muscles, how to stay flexible. So, you know, for the Mets to grab him, you, you go from one hall of famer to the next. It's just, it's ridiculous. Really. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I and I I um it was disappointing, like you said, to see him go, and and I think partly because he had come up with the Mets, yeah, it was so good right from the start. Um, and even though he he was a little bit older when he when he finally got there, um, he was so dominant for such a long period of time. It was fun to watch him pitch every time, but it's pro sports, and you know you can't fall in love with these guys forever because money in a lot of times a lot of cases dictates the player going somewhere else Absolutely. i think time will tell and of course I, I i don't wish bad upon anybody no matter who he plays for um i think time will tell it's probably not going to be a great contract for texas right. um just because he's been injury prone and you want to see them get their money's worth but i question whether that'll happen over the long haul um but it happens all the time. Teams have money. They have a need. There's a free agent they can go after. Um, they're thinking a lot of times these days, as we talked about before, with all those players that are getting tons of money well after they retire, uh, it's about those first few years of a contract. Teams yes. are usually willing to to bite the rest of it. If they get two or three good years out of somebody in a five-year deal, they're Absolutely. usually pretty happy with it. And, um, and we'll see uh, getting Verlander, doesn't happen a few years ago losing a guy like Degrom with the previous ownership uh it doesn't happen the Verlanders here but as you say they had those kinds of backup plans and looked at the big picture okay if this player uh signs somewhere else who's available that we can go after let's have those discussions right now and it was a short period of time once Degrom signed that Verlander yeah, it was, was days. Uh, was a New York yeah, Met. It, yeah. it so fast. Yeah, it just it was. I think back, it was only a couple of days. So they had plans in place uh, at that point, and and that's. I mean, yeah, it's fun being a fan because of those things. Because you yeah. you always lose some free agents, especially the teams with the younger guys. You know, the Seattle's like we talked about. Uh, they get good after a few years. They're going to get big money somewhere else and go. Or Oakland losing some of the guys they've done, but that's not going to happen with the Mets. I don't think too right. much when these young guys are moving up. And and I was I was so happy to see them sign Brandon Nemo because I oh, think he's man. such a yeah. order piece for the team. Is such a great player. Um, is somebody young fans can adore for all the right reasons from running to first uh, after a walk. Uh, from getting excited when he makes a big catch in the outfield. So to sign him told me something that, yeah, those guys want to be there, but ownership wants to keep its young stars in place for the fans right. to watch for years to come. Yeah. And that's always a great thing for a fan of that team. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. I'd like to uh, turn to the national league West. Uh, the Dodgers won 111 games last year, and they've been the dominant team of that division forever. Uh, the Padres are most people's pick to uh, become the division winners. Finally, uh, Padres won 89 games last year, but they have um, done that off-season work and got the pieces yeah. in place that they were lacking, that they needed to go up against the mighty Dodgers. Uh, will this be the year that the Padres finally knock the Dodgers off the perch or are the Dodgers going to stay there and the Padres still going to make the playoffs? What do you think, Barry? 
Uh, I think honestly, the 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 NL West has always been a division that you just don't know. No. You just don't know because you know obviously the, the 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 Dodgers have been the staple over the last five years, right? They've been very consistent in regards to making the playoffs. They got a World Series uh, championship, but you know who saw the Giants coming last year? Right. Yeah, yeah. Saw that coming. Yeah. Like so, so it's always some team that shocks you that has a good season. So who knows if it's gonna be the Diamondbacks? You know, they won seventy four games last year. The Rockies, they have a lot of young talent. Um, but I think if you're gonna think about the two, it, it might be a two team race, right? Is obviously you're gonna look at those two teams. They spend the most. Those are the two teams that are going to be battling. But I'm looking at those bottom teams that are really going to affect how that 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 um that division plays out. Because I think the Giants are going to be much improved. You know, they only won what 81 games last year, but I think that they can be able to improve on that with the signings that they made. Um, I think the Dodgers step back this year. Um, they won 111 games. I don't necessarily believe that they're going to win that many, but I think they're still going to be a viable team because I think that they're they're kind of putting pushing their chips into that that uh Shohei Itani race that right. that's going to happen in in in, uh, in uh the winter meetings. So you know we'll see exactly what happens, but I think I think the NL West is always going to be wild because you just never know about what team is going to be able to shock you, honestly. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Dale? Yeah. Well, and, and I'll just add, uh, I agree with all that, Barry, and I'll just add that I think it's maybe the Padres division to lose at this point yeah. because of the talent that they have. Absolutely. I think the Dodgers have taken a step back, losing uh, uh, Trey Turner, Justin Turner, and some of the other players that they've lost in the last year. Um, I mean, Trey Turner is just such a good player. I mean, as a awesome. Met fan, Amazing. you hate seeing him and what he does with Washington and, and uh, the Dodgers, now Philadelphia, but but he's such a good talent. Um, so they've lost a key piece there. Uh, so I think the Dodgers have stepped back a bit. I think, yeah, the Giants will be better. And, and some of the other the teams in the bottom have those chances. But I think San Diego's just signed so many players right now that uh, that it's their division Absolutely. Uh, to win or lose based on what they do. Absolutely. Yeah, I've, uh, I've got a really good friend from the Bay Area that's a massive Giants fan, and I hope they uh, can do, uh, push these two teams. Uh, unfortunately, they're up against these two teams right now who are, uh, you know, who do have massive payrolls and, and have uh, tons of talent. But uh, I think the Giants, uh, you know, finishing 500 last year was quite a shock to everybody, and uh, they have made some good moves. So I think, uh, yeah, it's going to be a three team race, and it'll be super fun to watch. Um, why don't we uh, switch to the AL? Uh, the central, I think it's Cardinals, Brewers, Cardinals, probably like usual, uh, you know, you can dispute that with you, if with me, if you want Dale, but what uh, I, I, I sort of like to gloss <laughs> over the central in both the conferences. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Dale, is that fine? Yeah. Or do you want no, to oh yeah, I'm good with that. I, I think Cleveland's probably got the best chance of winning the American League Central, you know, based on some of the young guys they've got. There's a couple former Mets that are, that have played well and Jimenez just signed a contract uh, um or is in the process of it. So yeah, I I think it's it's um it's up to up for grabs there for for the Indians to take. Um, I mean, Houston and the Yankees and the Blue Jays are probably the three main teams to talk about with the other two. Yeah. Uh, with the other two divisions in that uh, the Astros are just so good. The Yankees, I think, have improved drastically with some of the, the players they brought in, and so have the Blue Jays. And as a Canadian, I'm a Mets fan, but I'd still love to see Toronto uh, do well and have success. Absolutely. And, and, and they have great a lot players. Of things at Rogers. Yeah, yeah. So I think they're going to be fun to watch as well. Um, I think the Yankees and, and hey, we'll see what Boston can do after after what happened last year. But I think the Yankees and the Blue Jays are, are going to be battling it out uh, for for the division title there. And, and that's going to be fun to watch. And it's going to go back to the old days when uh, when the Blue Jays uh, were strong and the Yankees were a powerhouse team. They had some great series in September, the Blue Jays and Yankees. And, and I think we're going to get back to that this year. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely agree with Dale. I think that, yeah. you know, the, the toast of the, the AL right now is is either the Astros or the Yankees. You know, it, it's it's the Astros are just they're just a 
a well-oiled machine. You know, obviously they lost Verlander, but they have so much talent over there. They're so they're so well coached. I love Dusty Baker. I think Dusty Baker is one of the greatest managers to ever walk the planet. And Buck Showalter is right there with him as well. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, the Yankees, you know, they they have Judge there. They they have Volpe that just got called up. I want to see what that kid does. You know, he's going to, you know, there's a lot of pressure on him to be the next Derek Jeter, but th- he doesn't have to be. So, you know, they just have to allow him to be himself and um, just let the chips fall where they may. But, you know, the Yankees, they, they have a lot to prove. I think the Blue Jays more than the Yankees have a lot to prove because the Blue Jays have spent a lot of money. They've invested a lot in their team. And I think it's time for them to be able to ascend and, and see if they can be able to, uh, to t- take that division. The Red Sox. You know the Red Sox losing um, their 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 big player over the over the summer, which was a shock. Um, yeah. You know Bogarts, and, and but they were able to keep. Um, what's the other kid's name? Um, what's his name? Third baseman. Uh, I got the lineup yeah. right in front of me as well. They just got they they, they just gave him a big yeah. deal, but you know they kept him in. T- if they can be able to, to oh yeah, make. Yeah. Yeah, to make some trades because you know they're lacking a lot. Their starting pitching is not that that desirable. Um, but they're a tough team. They're a scrappy team. So we'll see what they can be able to do. But like it's it's the it's the it's the Astros. Devers. It's the Yankees. Yeah. Yes, um, Devers. Devers. Yeah, Devers. And Devers. and also too the team that we're really not talking about right there where you guys are are is the Seattle Mariners. They're yeah. on the rise. <laughs> they are on the rise. They have a nice young team over there. They they have a lot of potential and they can make a lot of noise uh, this year. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm really excited about the Mariners. I'm excited about that AL East race. Um, they, uh, the Rays have been, uh, you know, one of the teams that you have to worry about in that AL East. Always. I, yeah, Always. I think they've mm-hmm. taken a tiny step back. Maybe their analytics isn't as uh, ingenious as it was a few years back and uh, yeah. maybe they, they won't be competing, but you never know about the Boston Red Sox. They're always spending a ton of money and bringing in lots of talent. You mentioned Devers and they've got a great lineup when you see yeah. it, good pitching, uh, that, that, um, AL East though, I've seen a lot of people here North of the border saying the Jays got it this year, uh, after a pretty good regular season, uh, flaming out, uh, in two games and losing to the Mariners. That was a really big wake up call and they have addressed a lot of the uh, shortfalls that they had last year. And I think they put things in place to finally make a big run at it. Unfortunately, they have to play in that East where there are, you know, such tough, tough t- teams. Uh, Astros uh, really reached another level, uh, solidifying, you know, the, the the title last year just to, uh, you know, dissuade all everybody that said right. just a bunch of cheaters. And when they won in 2017, it really wasn't, you know, something that we should look upon well up upon, but um, they will be in a tough dogfight with the Mariners who have uh, taken 20 years to finally build this franchise, but uh, they are an exciting team. And I can't believe all the good pieces that they have for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Well, about and the, it's fun uh, watching a team like Seattle because they've got, like you say, so many young players and when they come together, you know, we talk about all the big stars and, and the Mets have spent all the money and signed these guys. But when you get some of these teams that somewhat build from inside that, that you know, raise their talent and they come up and much like the Mets have with all their young guys, it's fun to watch that. And Special, you just, you, yeah. You get excited about those teams. They might not be your favorite team, but you still want to see a win. You get excited about it because um, it shows that the system is working and the players right. are coming up and you don't have to spend the big money. Once they get to be stars, they might not be able to keep them all. But for the time being, they all come up together and, and they show good things. And it, it gets the fans back into the ballpark and it gets people excited about them. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't wait to watch Julio Rodriguez. I, I love yeah. Yeah. that kid. Uh, he's so he's so good. And he and he yeah. enjoys the game. Yeah, it is like a joy. Yeah. It's a joy that yeah. he plays with, man. And I love that. Um, do you want to pick uh, MVP? Um Either the both leagues, uh, do you have a, a favorite that you think is going to win AL MVP, uh, NL MVP, mm. Dale? Oh, man, put us on the spot here. Put on the spot. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, 
you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look, I'm going to look at maybe what I and stick with the Mets on this one, what Francisco Lindor can do, because I don't think we've really seen him, you know, he got much better last year than he was. And it takes some time. You're there, Barry, it takes some time to be able to, uh, acclimatize yourself to playing in yes. New York City, and we talked yes. about Degrom and yes. and maybe how it wasn't that easy for him. But Lindor's a star, and, and I don't think we've really seen him be a star in New York as much as he can be. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do, and and whether he's MVP or not. But I think he can put up MVP numbers uh, and and seriously challenge anybody else to be to be that good in the National League. So let me let me throw his name out to start with. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you with that. I think um I think Lindor can have a big season, but the guy that I'm looking for that I'm looking to be the MVP in the National League is Juan Soto. I I yeah. think that he has a stranglehold on him because of the talent. He's just so good, and yeah. and we got to talk about like it's it's literally like a contract year for him. He wants a big deal, yeah. so um you can see you can probably maybe we'll have another judge part two where we have a, a one of those walk years that just looks amazing right so um i think he has a i think he's a front runner in the al i mean how can you go with with, with anybody but shohei right uh shohei is just he, he's a freak it, it, there's nothing that that kid can't do um so i think he's definitely you know one of the front runners but the guy that I'm really looking towards to really have a, a strong impact and maybe have an MVP season is Vladdy Jr. I think Vladdy Jr. Yeah. is it's one of the best young players I've seen in a long time. Just unbelievable power, um, great plate discipline, understands what, what he's looking at. So I, I can't I, – I'm not going to put it past him either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. I think, think otani has got the best chance. Vladdy, yeah. uh, um, I, I think that uh, Shohei kind of has it hands down if he pitches all year and he, you know, bats pretty decent. I think most uh, voters will just be like, all right, well, we got to right. go with him. You know, he's pretty he's, – he's two men in one body, so – yeah, you gotta put it. You, <laughs> you have you have to have a crazy year like what Aaron Judge did to to, to supplant yeah. him. Yeah, uh, Trey and, Turner. And look good in the best uniform a... down the road. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, I think Trey Turner is going to uh, come off the World yeah. Baseball Classic. Uh, how great he was! I think he was the best player in the tournament, in my opinion. And uh, I think he's going to have an M MVP type year with the Phillies are. Dark horse, dark horse MVP in the National League. I'm saying it right now, Pete Alonzo is going to be on a mission. Nice. Look, that he. I yeah. saw there was a. Um, I can't remember what particular news outlet put this out, but they put a top ten power hitters in baseball, and Pete Alonzo wasn't on it. Weird. And yeah. I was just yeah. like, like very, very weird. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. look out for Pete Alonzo. Um, I, there, I like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good. Good. Uh, there are a ton of milestones uh, that uh, players are going to be trying to get towards this year. I want to mention a few of them. Uh, Mike Trout has 350 homers so far uh, with a really great year. He could hit 400. Um, he hit 40 last year in only 119 games. So I think he has a shot. He's uh, amazing. He has 104 RBIs to reach a thousand for his career. And he's going to get that. doubles to reach 300. So um, Trout is also going to be a guy that gets that MVP consideration year after every year. year. Yeah, he's he's amazing, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. He's been so good for so long that we are kind of numb to his greatness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're, we're just kind of yeah. just like, you know, we talk about all of these other players, the Fernando Tatis, the Vladdy Jr., the Shohei's. But this guy is just constant. <laughs> greatness yep. and we're just like ah mike yeah. trout whatever yeah he's gonna give us 40 and hit 290 and he'll be fine like but you, you know you really have to start taking a look Amazing. and taking a step back and saying man you know this guy is putting together a real truly hall of fame career like he's gonna be a 3,000 maybe 500 home run hitter and yeah. that is mm -hmm. something that is very rare it's extremely mm -hmm. rare yeah. so That's you know true. Well, yeah. And it'll be interesting to see where it goes with with 
Trout and, and Otani in, right. in Los Angeles and the Angels. and Can they make you know, the playoffs? Their, yeah. Their mm-hmm. lack of being able to put together a competitive team for that big market. And right. uh, it's going to be important for them to do that uh, or they – they lose may one probably for sure, and maybe another one down the road. And that he wants to try to maybe finish his career with a team and and win a World Series title. And that yeah. opportunity might not be with the Angels right now. I, I'm not. I, I I'm gonna say something. I'm gonna have a hot take here, Dale. I think that if Shohei leaves the Angels, which is a great possibility that he does, I think that Trout leaves too. I, I think agree. that they I yeah. think that they I think he looks at it and says, you know what? I've done all I can here. Um yeah. I want to have a chance to at least try to win. You know, I have all the, the single accolades, I have all these MVPs, I've finished top 3, top 5 in MVPs of all of these years, but I want to be a part of a team that I can just be a guy rather than yeah. the guy because him being the guy hasn't really worked. So maybe being a guy would be better for him in whatever situation he goes to. Don't you think? Doesn't that get to be? I was just gonna say, doesn't that get to be the ultimate big decision in a player's life? Yeah. eh? When you spend your entire career with a team, and and you see so many guys that just want to stay there their entire career. They love the city. They love the organization. Doesn't matter what sport it is. But you're getting near the end. You're still valuable, um, but you don't see the opportunity there. So. Do you go somewhere else to win, especially if you haven't, if you've never won, or do you stay with that team? I think all players are going to go through that, and and Mike right. Trout's going to most likely face that uh, with the Angels. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. I think that organization is going to try to do everything it can to keep both those guys because uh, they have to. They're, they're both once in a generation yeah. players. They have to. Yeah. Look, yeah. Could you imagine losing not one once in a generational player, but both? Uh, it's. Yeah. I don't know how you uh you you appeal that to your fan base, but however, however, there's also a, a flip side to this, right? If the I, Angels are are out of it, if they're not in contention, I think you have to look at it from a front office standpoint right. and say we can be able to get a boatload of prospects back and be able to replenish this thing. And it, obviously, they're not going to be these two guys, but at least we're going to be able to to start fresh, get some good prospects in here and be able to develop this team the right way because right now they they have a they've spent a lot of money on this team. They have a lot of players that it's just not working, right? Like Rendon is a great player, but is he is it working? It's not working. So they have to kind of look at this and say this might be the year that if they they are not in contention Mm-hmm. Um, for when they have to be in there before the trade deadline, it might be time to just get rid of all the big contracts and start from scratch. Yeah. Because that, and, and if you, uh, the Mets will want a Shohei Tani at the deadline, you're going to get a boatload for him regardless. But why not get something for him when you have him rather than him going to free agency and you lose him and you just get a compensatory pick? So, yeah. You know that that that's something that they're really going to have to weigh with all of their big contracts this year. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a franchise altering year for the Angels. Yeah. It really is. It really is. Awesome. Wouldn't want to be in charge of marketing with the oh, Angels. No, if they have no. to free agency. <laughs> oh no, free agency. I'll probably have to move. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't uh, it hasn't worked with the Nationals that Juan Soto trade. Uh, they got a boatload of prospects, but I don't think it's still early. It's early. It's yeah. early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's early. Uh, um, another milestone that's about to be reached is Giancarlo Stanton, 378 home runs, only 22 from the big 400. Uh, he can become the 58th major leaguer to reach 400 home runs. Oh. Uh, he only needs 29 RB- RBIs uh, to reach 1,000, 28 doubles to hit 300. So, Big milestones for him looks very reachable. All of those numbers this year, absolutely. I mean, you know that this is another guy that, excuse me, if he would have stayed healthy throughout his career, you know those numbers are higher. So yeah. you know he's a he's a phenomenal talent. Um, big guy, strong guy, real, real like natural power. Um, so those those um 
those particular milestones, those stats are going to be reached probably in the first half of the season, mm-hmm. honestly, if he can be able to stay healthy. Stay healthy. Yeah, he's such a talent and, and such a great hitter. You know, he kind of wasn't in the limelight as much last year. I mean, you're there, so you get to see a little bit more from a day-to-day basis. But with the outstanding year that Aaron Judge had, um, there was so much focus on him, and, and it kind of took away from Stanton a little yeah. bit more. But, yeah, boy, he, he can power the ball out of the ballpark. So absolutely, it would be fun to see them both back in there and, and healthy and strong and, and hitting for the Yankees. And they need it. They need it. Like that yeah. Sure. They yeah. need it. <laughs> um, yeah. On the Cardinals, Nolan Arenado, uh, just one homer away from 300, 32 ribeyes away from 1,000. And uh, also with Gold, uh, Paul Goldschmidt, he got the 300 homers last year. Keeps continuing to chip away at records. 58 RBIs to get to 1,100 and 18 doubles to get to 400 career two-baggers. So uh, milestones there in the, with the Cardinals. Manny Machado, 17 homers short of 300. Wow, he's, uh, he's going mm-hmm. there. Um, Pete, Alon- Pete Alonzo, uh, we mentioned him a little bit earlier. Uh, he is 54 homers shy of 200. Uh, he's hit more homers uh, in the past four years than any other major leaguer. So um, wow. you mentioned that, that he wasn't in that top 10 list, which is ridiculous. Yeah, and I think 54 home runs is very, very doable for him this season. Yeah, you know that the, the yeah. way he's looking, you know, he's slimmed down. He's he's he, you, you know he's really taken his um his nutrition to 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 heart this season. He wants to win. He wants a big contract as well. Let's mm-hmm. not forget that. Like you know, the Mets are him are going to be in negotiations, so he's looking for a contract north of 200 million dollars. And honestly what he brings to the table for the Mets as an ambassador for the team, as a great player, as a homegrown talent, as a fan favorite. I mean, seven or eight for 200 is they, they need to just pencil it in. I understand that there's, you know, there's other, there's other deals out there that are, that are comparable, you know, the uh, Freddie Freeman deal, uh, the deal that, um, what's the other guy, the, the Braves first baseman, what do you got? He, he got a big deal. He got a deal from the Braves after they made that trade. So that's kind of what the Mets are looking for. But sometimes you have to pay for the character of the guy more than just the production or what you believe the production will be in the next five or six years. So I think that Pete, his value to this team is worth $200 million, just in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and the upside, I think, is so huge. I mean, he's yeah. he's still learning the game. He's still young. And, and you can see how uh, excited and anxious he is to learn more and be a better player. His first right. base, uh, work at first base is uh, outstanding. You know, how much he's improved as, as a fielder. Uh, he could always hit the ball. And he's going to learn more and more. He swings at some wild pitches at times. And, and as he progresses and gets a little bit older and gets a little more experience, um, I mean, it's fun watching, you know, uh, Goldschmidt and Arenado and some of those guys because they're just good, solid contact hitters. And right. they don't swing at too many bad pitches. No. Um, Pete's, Pete's still getting there, but he's going to be a good one for a long, long period of time. Um, and, and he's just his first base skills have improved so much that he's really worked himself into that full time position, not just as a DH with somebody, but as a full time player because Absolutely. of the hard work he's put in. And, and the enthusiasm he's got as well. So Yeah, I agree. And and also, just to add, you know, talking about Paul Goldschmidt, he's another one that you just kind of numb to. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt, yeah, he's good. good. Yeah, he's just, he's, he's just, he's, he's just ridiculous. You know, the glove, the, 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 the bat, everything about the guy is just, he's just a solid baseball player. Nolan Arenado is the best third baseman in, in, in this generation. Um, you know, he's just he he's just a staple of consistent defense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you know exactly mm-hmm. what you're getting out of him in that hot corner. Yeah. You know he's yeah. you can state you can pencil him in for thirty and a hundred every year. That's just him. So um, yeah. you know he's just he's just a great player, man. I wanted the Mets to get him. I think we I, we we had kicked the tires on the trade, but they never did it. And of course they let the Cardinals get him. And I wasn't I wasn't happy about that. <laughs> wasn't happy about that at all. I know. Yeah. Uh, Matt Olson, the first baseman for the Matt Braves. Olson. Yes, thank yeah. you, yeah. thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, Manny Machado, seventeen homers short of three hundred. Rizzo is also seventeen short of three hundred. They're both tied right now. 
Um, he is a long shot away from a uh, thousand RBIs. A hundred. He needs hundred and eleven this year to get a thousand RBIs. But that's not too. That's not too bad. He can probably get that. Nine yeah. in two, 2016, 2017. So uh, he could get a thousand RBIs. That would be a good milestone for him. Uh, Canadian Freddie Freeman. Uh, we talked about him at the uh, beginning. He needs Great ninety-seven player. hits to get two thousand. Wow. Um, eight homers to get 359 RBIs for 1,100. So, what a great, what a great player. What a yeah, great player. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bryce Harper recovering from injury right now, but he just needs 15 homers for 300, two doubles for also 387 RBIs, short of 1,000. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon went back to Pittsburgh. Kind of great mm-hmm. that he's back there. Uh, Glad only to see 50, that. 52 hits from 2,000. 13 homers from 300 and eight doubles to 400. So um, nice. He's going to, he's going to join a, 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 a elite list of hall of famers and great Pittsburgh pirates that have played this game. Um, You know, he was, he was, he was a real joy to watch, man. When he was at his apex, when he was at his prime, he was really, really good. And he's still a very good hitter now. Like he's not, he's not a terrible player. Um, he's still yeah. able to, to, you know, his bat speed is still there. You know, he's still somebody that can be able to give you, you know, hit 250 to 270. So, you know, he's still a viable player. And and I think Pittsburgh is going to be really, really better off. The young players are going to be better off having him there. I don't, yeah. I don't think that they're going to have a big time season. They have a lot of holes to fill. They're not that talented, but just having him there is going to impact those young players and really, you know, give them some 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 uh information going forward in their careers. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And let me Darren throw out one more guy. Maybe you're still going to bring him up, a Joey Votto from the Cincinnati Reds, and how much fun it's been to watch him, a, a Canadian as well. But I was just quickly looking up his stats as you were talking. Uh, 342 home runs, a career 297 hitter. Uh, RBIs, uh, he's at 1106, so he's put up such great numbers. It may be his final season with the Cincinnati yeah. Reds, uh, but he's done so much for that franchise. And, you know, I saw something the other day and, and all those great teams that the, the big red machine had over the years and in the 70s. But he could go down as one of the, the greatest Cincinnati Reds hitters of all time. Absolutely. And, uh, it would be great to see him finish up with uh, with an awesome season for the Reds. Yeah. And who knows, maybe he does go somewhere else. Maybe he's one of those guys that – that has to make a decision. Does he want to go to a contender at the trade deadline? Yeah, that great point, Dale. I think I think you you know Votto may be one of those guys to get moved just to just as the organization can like do him a favor. You know, it's one of those yeah. thank you for your time type of thing. Sure. Um, but you know what a what a smart hitter, what a great hitter, what a generational hitter. So you know it 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 will be sad if it, if this is his last year, but. You know, if he can be able to land somewhere or if the Reds can surprise people and have a great season, it, that's possible, too. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, he starts the year on the injured list, so hopefully it's nothing too serious and he can stay yeah. healthy. But, um, yeah, one of the greatest Canadians to ever don a uniform, and uh, he's been a staple there. Cincinnati and brought a lot of uh, respect there because he's such a great guy and such Absolutely. an talented player for sure. Uh, I just want to throw out a few pitchers milestones. Clayton Kershaw, three wins short of 200, under 93 strikeouts to hit 3,000. Uh, he will become the 21st, 22nd player to get there. There's uh, another uh, pitcher trying to get there as well. Um, Kershaw's just been, you know, one of the most talented pitchers of his generation. So Absolutely. Absolutely. He, he's just – you know, a model of consistency, not in postseason, but the regular season. Yeah. Right. Um, but you know, he's he's definitely definitely a borderline. I mean, Dale, what do you think? Borderline Hall of Famer, or you think he's a Hall of Famer? Yeah, you know what? That's pretty close. I think I I would probably lean towards it happening. Um, and because of his competitive spirit, he's been such a competitor, eh? I mean, he's fun to watch, doesn't matter if you cheer for the Dodgers or not, but it was always fun to go out and watch or to watch him go out on the mound and pitch and, and such a fierce competitor and, and, you know, has had success and not as much, but in, in the postseason as well. But yeah, I, I got to think, you know, he's, he's closer to being in the hall of fame than not at this point. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. 
Uh, Adam Wainwright, uh, he's uh, injured currently, but he just needs five victories from 200 uh, once he gets healthy. Uh, you Darvish, five wins from 100. Uh, he posted 93 wins in Japan before he came over. Um, he had an incredible baseball classic, looked really good. Uh, 212 pitcher. strikeouts from 2,000 career punchouts for him, so chasing that. Uh, Wade Miley, one win from 100. Zach Greinke, 118 strikeouts to get 3,000. Um, he's 75 more than Kershaw right now, so he looks like he's going to be the 20th player to get that 3,000 um, because he's a little bit ahead. Uh, Garrett Cole, uh, some are picking him to get the AL Cy Young this year. He's just 70 strikeouts away from 2,000, only 32 years of age. Uh, really uh, has had a fantastic career already. Uh, and re some relief pitchers, um, uh, Craig Kimbrell, six saves away from 400. Wow. That's seventh all time. Uh, he's trying to chase down Billy Wagner in sixth at 422, John Franco in fifth at 424. So he's just 31 short of top five all time. Uh, Kenley Jansen sits just right behind Kimbrell, eighth all time, nine away from 400 and could reach top five maybe even sooner than Kimbrell. Just depends. Uh, and Mark Melanson, 38 saves to hit 300 for his career. Uh, he's got 38 three different seasons, so it's doable for, for him. So lots of milestones, like quite the list. Yeah, uh, yeah. and we, we don't want to talk about closers and, and how many saves they're getting right now. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a touchy subject for us. All right. Yeah. There. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who's uh, who's going to be their closer? Do you have an inside uh, scoop for me so I can place them tomorrow on my roster for draft? I think honestly, I think Robertson may have the inside scoop yeah. just because he has the experience there. Um, and you know, going forward, I think Buck is just really going to see how it goes. If Robertson is covers uh, comfortable there. Then you know, then he'll can he can be able to stay there. But if he does fall into some trouble, then now you're gonna have to be you know closing by committee type of situation. And they have the arms to do that. I honestly, I, I want to know what Dale feels about this. I have a very very interesting feeling that Tyler McGill yeah. might be the guy. Nice to step up and be the closer. He has that type yeah. of stuff. I don't know if the organization wants to do that with him and, you know, uh, kind of, I, I, they might want to keep him as a starting pitcher. I don't know, but he has the stuff to close. So, you know, whether they experiment with that this season, whether they, they have to, you know, they probably might have other guys that step up, but that's something to watch. That's something to watch. Yeah. Right? No, that that's an interesting one, Barry, because I I think that the way Peterson pitched in the spring in spring training for him yeah. to to get on to the um uh you know rotation the starters yeah into the rotation that way um moves McGill into another area or or gives him other opportunities that way and we've seen other I mean you think of John Smoltz as maybe one of the classic examples of a starter for so many years and went to the bullpen right. and was so dominant at that point to. To, and especially as a closer to get that final, those final three outs. Um, it would be great to see, you know, Edwin Diaz for as much as we're all disappointed. He's not there. I, I think it's safe to assume he, he it was going to be tough to duplicate what he did last year. Right. There were just so many things that came into play from, from the, the trumpet entrance to the success he had and the strikeout rate and everything else. It's tough to duplicate that. So even though we're disappointed, would want to see him back and, and be healthy. Um, probably it wasn't going to fit in exactly the way it did last year, but I'm, I'm intrigued by, uh, Tyler McGill because he's such a hard thrower and he's such an imposing figure in the mound that they've Big got guy, to find a yeah. place for him somewhere. When he came yeah. up, he, he played so well, they've got to find a place for him and, and maybe that's where they move him. Yeah. 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 I'm, like I'm interested to see it, man. Yeah. I, I think, you know, Buck, Buck is the, is the man for the job. Uh, I think, you know, they're going to be able to figure it out, man. And that's the thing. That's the beauty about sports, right? Is that when there's there's doom and gloom with the fan base, somebody goes down, someone steps up that you never realize and they go ahead and just run with it. 
So, you know, we'll we'll see, man. We'll see who's going to answer the call and it's it's next man up. We'll see. Yeah. Well, and and adding to that, you know, I, I remember Gary Cohen talking in the broadcast last year and it was probably three quarters of the way through the season when they had a, a pretty sizable lead and he said, you know, if you just followed social media, you would think the New York Mets had not won a game all season. <laughs> um and some of the some of the groups that I'm part of, it's it's funny because somebody will say the most outrageous thing and all of a sudden there's 300 comments and occasionally right. I'll go to them and, and everybody's just, what are you thinking? Are you serious? <laughs> like, um, it's it's a crazy fan base and maybe Very. that's why they're they're underdogs and maybe that's why um, I've I've grown to to love them over the years that way and that they're they're the lovable losers in some way but i think that is going to turn now because i think they can be the lovable winners or the hated winners from everybody right. else's standpoint but uh um and one more quick thing that you mentioned buck show walter don't the the players just love playing for uh, that guy and that's he's, fun to see it's not he, always easy i'm sure for a player managers can come in different ways younger yeah. older more experienced but he's got the experience to know how to handle these guys. Uh, it doesn't matter what their age is. And they've, they've got, you know, the Verlanders and Scherzers and Ottavinos that are in their high 30s or 40. Um, but he can handle all these guys. And I, I just love him as manager of that baseball team. Yeah, I, I, I agree with every point that you made, man. And just to talk about Buck, you know, quick story on, on my side. I remember uh, when the Mets fired, um, what's the guy's name? What was Rojas. the manager? Yes, Rojas. Yeah. And I, this was months before Buck yeah. was even a name. I went to my podcast and I said, there's only one guy that the Mets <laughs> need to be looking at. And they need to throw all the yeah. money at him possible. And it's Buck Showalter. Because yeah. Buck Showalter, and Darren, I'm sure you're going to agree with this because you're a Yankee fan. Buck Showalter is one of the most underrated overlooked managers in the history of baseball like for some reason they always look at buck in a negative way because he doesn't have a world series championship and for for a long time him and dusty baker were that same type of guy they're builders they can take the the they can they can have the bare bones of just framework and build that car and build the mm -hmm. build the nicest Bentley that you can see, right? But sometimes they don't see the fruits of their labor. You know, just mm -hmm. like the same thing when he was with the with the Yankees, he didn't end up winning the World Series. Joe Torre won it. Just like when he went to the Texas Rangers, they were pretty good, and then somebody else took over. Right. Just like when he went to when he went to the Diamondbacks, they won a hundred games, and then they got rid of him. And then and then and then Brentley won uh, won the championship. On, so man. so yeah. you know so you, you keep seeing all of these these places these stops. We're not even going to talk about Baltimore what he did with them, right? So all of these stops he has developed and built up these franchises from the ground up. That now it's time for him to cash out, just like how Dusty Baker finally got his yeah. moment in the sun. Yeah. It's time for Buck to get his, and I think. He's in the proper organization, and he has the right front office to be able to get him exactly where he needs to be. Very good point. Yeah. Very good yeah. point. I agree yeah, wholeheartedly. And unfortunately, that happens to a ton of uh, coaches, general managers. They build this uh, great team, and they they fizzle out that first yeah. year. And the organization picks up. Right. He comes in, and he takes all the credit for the victory. But it was the other guys that really built that foundation. Absolutely. Absolutely. All the time. Uh, do you either one of you guys do DraftKings fan duel? Uh, do you ever dabble into that world of fantasy, daily fantasy sports? I I don't. I have people yeah. that do. Um, it's something that, you know, I, I never I never really thought about too much for myself personally, but obviously I have other people that do. I have a cousin, he loves to gamble on baseball. Every yeah. time he's he's um he's doing something, he calls he's me and says, Hey. Who do you think? Who do you think? Who's pitching? Who, who like so? You know, I I like to help people out and do that, but to do it for myself, you know, it may be a little bit too much for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm probably in the same boat. Uh, uh, 
I get home and watch the Mets games every day, and that's my focus. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's too. It's too much. It's too much emotion that goes into that day. I, I can't. I can't use. I can't. I can't use any more emotions than anything else. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I might Three and be a half hours out. a day is enough. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I play uh, quite consistently, and I might Good. reach out for some uh, little insider information. Yeah. You guys yeah. follow uh, that team <laughs> and other teams a little tighter than I do sometimes. But I we'll do help you win some money, there. We'll help you yeah, with some money. Yeah, I can yeah. find some money if I win. I'm in some big, I'm in some big <laughs> contests for tomorrow. I have what's what they call a uh, showdown. It's the uh, the Mets and the Marlins game and i had to pick uh six players yeah. to represent me for it i've got pete alonzo as my captain he gets one and a half points for every point that he gets in the fantasy then i've got scherzer mcneil escobar and robertson as okay. my es Mets on that, Esco uh, escobar's a dark horse okay yeah and then <laughs> i got uh, lewis areas um as the the marlins and uh he came over uh, winning the batting title last year in the American League. So, uh, mm -hmm. in the other league. So, uh, it is, um, it seems to me that I, I, I have a really good chance of winning some money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I fingers like crossed for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a contest. Uh, it's, it's a 500K total prize pool, 100K to first, uh, $15 entry fee. So, uh, that wasn't too rich for my blood. Yeah. I'm also in uh, a couple other uh, contests to try to make me some money. So what a, what a great way to start opening day. Absolutely. Uh, getting a, a huge prize. Uh, this has been one of my <laughs> favorite uh, times to get into the season because I have been off work the entire spring training. I wake up every morning. Uh, 10 a.m. <laughs> are the first games here uh, locally. I have been just blown away at the coverage that ESPN uh, has been giving on spring training games unprecedented access to the players. They mic them up in the outfield. You talked about Buck Showalter. I've heard Buck Showalter on the mic during innings uh, about great. four times through spring training, and it has been absolute pleasure. <laughs> uh, uh, so many mic'd up moments throughout the game while the game's going on. Uh, they did an amazing job this spring training and made me really, really appreciate how great the game is. Absolutely, man. It's, it's going to be a fun season there, and I, I can't wait. It's going to be so, like I said, you know, we talked about this already, so many storylines and subplots and all all types of things that are going to happen. And, you know, just mm -hmm. to seeing how how the pitch clock is going to work, how, you know, the yeah. the if, if the stolen bases are really going to see an increase. And, you know, just to see how the players respond to the rule changes and how the umps are going to respond to it as well. You know, they're going to be under yeah. fire. Yeah this season, you know, they're really going to be under it. So I, I want to see how they handle it, you know, how they be able to balance it out. Cause obviously the start of the season is going to be pretty rough, but towards the middle of the season, they're going to get a, they're going to get a routine and understand what's needed. And, you know, I, I expect some, some great baseball to be played, man. Really. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're down. And it's such an exciting time because everybody is approaching tomorrow with uh, an even chance of winning yep. essentially. Uh, it starts to get dictated uh, by tomorrow, but everybody is is excited for those reasons. And and those of us that have teams that have spent the money and have a good looking team have that much more reason to be excited. So yeah, Absolutely. I'm I'm pumped about it. Uh, I'm I'm coming to New York sometime in October to visit you, buddy, and uh, all right, to partner for it. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait, man. Let's let's and, let's. It'll be a Met parade, not a Yankee one, buddy. Right, exactly. Let's hope for a Subway Series, and then we'll get our revenge yeah. from two thousand. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, that would be an incredible Subway Series. Uh, I'll I'll be there. We'll be we'll all be uh, attending games, and it'll be uh, yeah, most some of the most fun. I'm I'm sure that so sure games to to witness that we've ever seen. Yeah, it's been a long time. 2000 that's uh 23 years that's yeah, a long crazy. time that long, long time yeah yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> the new new york will be alive it'll be lit up it'll be nice uh, to be there in october uh let's let's start looking at tickets dale and uh <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's I'm start good for it. tickets I'm right now it. i uh i hope it happens can't wait uh this is this was really fun man uh, yeah you guys uh gave me so much great feedback and uh i look look ahead at the season uh i'm sure the the viewers and listeners to this podcast are going to love it as much as i did 
I hope you guys enjoyed yourself and I uh, appreciate your time. We'll have to uh, do some check-ins through this, through the season and uh, yeah, we'll do this again. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I personally had a blast, you know, it was great to meet Dale. Um, yeah. You know, everybody, everybody knows a lot of baseball in this room. So it was great conversation and, you know, we got to do it again. Let, you know, we can, we can constantly, you know, we can figure out a schedule and, you know, probably do a couple as as the season goes on and, and, and you know, really get some some consistent uh, calling here. But it, it was great, man. I, I think it was it, it was a great, great podcast. Um, thanks for having us. And, you know, anytime you need me on, Darren, I'm always here. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks no, so much, from my Darren. part as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Darren, I saw you in person and had lunch a week ago. Uh, and incredible. again, Barry, I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you. It's, Absolutely. it's been one of my dreams uh, when you live way out here in Canada and uh, on the west side. Uh, it's tough to get to New York. I've never been there before. I've seen the Mets play in uh, in Seattle a few times, and that's been it. So I'm I'm uh, we're we're looking at flights and trying to get out there. So we will connect sometime soon. Absolutely, absolutely. I I, I can't wait to get you here so so I could so I could take you to Queens, man. You could you could sit in oh, City Field man, and experience that. <laughs> Yeah, and Barry's yeah. never been out here to uh, right. our neck of the woods, so we're going to have to have him, uh, too. We'll do an exchange once we go. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll well, see. We've I'm, got I'm in the Okanagan, and we're known for our great wine here. So. <laughs> All right. I definitely. I wanna, <laughs> we're going to sample some of that. Man. I, 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 I'm already thinking about making plans out there anyway, man. So, you know, it's um, we're, we're, me and, my, me and my, my best friend, man, we, we've uh, – We've been having our eyes set on Canada, so we're gonna make sure that we try to try to get something going this year. Love it! I yeah, can't wait. Awesome. Nope. Yeah, Good I'm stuff. gonna I'm gonna pause it, everyone. I'm gonna say goodbye to these guys, and then I'll do a little sign off when they're gone off into their evening. So uh, just give me a sec, but uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll sign off. Uh, I'll just pause it, and then I can talk to you guys in a sec. So uh, hang on. Okay, my guests have left. Uh, Barry, it's just the woo, it's uh, a little after 11. Um, yeah, so uh, wow, what a great podcast! That was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. That was that was a great conversation. Those guys are amazing and and so insightful. Uh, definitely New York uh, centric podcast for baseball, but I think we covered quite a bit of great stuff. So, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, i hope we can put it t uh, together another couple of podcasts through the season and it would be really fantastic uh the the clock is still ticking uh we are down to 13 hours 51 minutes and 28 seconds from first pitch uh tomorrow morning uh i yeah, yeah I, i'm excited this is a this is going to be an unprecedented and incredible 2023 baseball season uh, if you're a baseball fan, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, uh, try to let me make you a baseball fan. Try to let somebody get you into baseball. It has been a lifelong passion and incredible thing in my life. And I've been so blessed. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, I got into baseball at a young age. And it still gives me as much joy and pleasure, even though I'm not playing anymore. Uh, I still get so much pleasure from it, talking about it, watching it, and uh, just being immersed in the baseball culture. So uh, I do want to thank our partners and sponsors before I go. I want to thank uh, Anchor.fm, easiest place to make a podcast, phenomenal at posting on multiple podcast platforms for us. If you want to do podcasting, they're the only place to turn Anchor.fm. Uh, Verbero, the hockey equipment and apparel company, an industry leader in technology, performance, and value. And uh, they always like talking about the V350 stick. Uh, it is a must-have for any hockey player in your midst. Pampas and Possibilities, they come into your home and design some really beautiful things. Spruce it up, make it look great. It's, a, it's got some West Coast vibes to it, and uh, you will love it. Uh, you can find details on our website as well as Forever Living, the aloe vera company for health and beauty products. They have great products that we have for sale on our site at discounted rates, and I use them all around my home. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate you sticking in and watching it. Thanks so much for the support lately. It's really growing, and I'm very happy to see uh, the fan base growing. Take care of yourself. Have a great week. Enjoy the baseball season ahead. 
And keep tuning in to Complete Sports Media and Complete Media Network. We've got tons of great things coming your way. So love you. Bye for now. Take care.